Hello, the Revenum, and welcome back to TNO with the Lasses of Europe, as you probably know by now in episode 5, but I hope you're having a pretty good day. My name is Mr. Mokulover, of course, but to lad Industrial Development Act passes. Hanato's hand had been starting to cramp as he stamped approved on request at request for the new tax exemptions introduced by the Light Industrial Development Act. The pile of newspapers, or just papers on his desk, was just the applicants from a section of his, the city of Nagoya. There must have been hundreds of pencil pushers like him across the country whose sole task was to process these applications. Despite the aching in his hand, he felt rather upbeat about the volume of applications. Undoubtedly, the tax relief would save many local businesses from collapsing or being cannibalized by larger corporations. He had heard of and seen for himself the phenomenon of towns, cities, and entire prefectures being left behind to languish in economic stagnation as industries failed and fled the region, leaving the area to be a shadow of its former self. Hinato was glad such a fate might not e reach Nagoya. Looking outside the window, Hinata could see a city once more abundant, slowly roaring back to life. The streets were no longer filled with beggars, but bustling with commuters and families. The factory smokestacks bellowed dark smoke once more, the fruits of the fire of industry. The skies were painted gray with storm clouds and smog, yet it was a city more vibrant and colorful than he had seen in several years. Nagoya and the rest of Japan was climbing out of their pit of recession at long last into a shaky normalcy. Business as usual in a new normal. And of course, we read this one last time. We're ensuring political loyalty here, in which we still have an act to pass where we need to save some political power. Even though at the end of the last episode, I did choose um, one of these. I think I chose conservatives. Went back, undid it. Didn't really help us out too much. We get like a few more NPs. Not really worth it. I don't exactly remember what I clicked on earlier, but we are, we did increase unemployment subsidies. So that's also very good for us too. Except we get a little more inflation. Oh well. Up next, to save a little more political power and make sure we get this one passed before we do this one as well. Because we lose up to 75 political power here, which is not good. Whatever. And even though we do get more faction power, which is actually very strong, we're going to do floating air bases. Our aircraft carrier's histories are laden with glory, earned from successful engagements fought across the Pacific, however. The technology, which was so effective in the past, is of no use to us now. New designs will need to be manufactured rapidly for to ensure our ability to project power into every corner of the globe. The co prosperity sphere, where their allies will be protected, and with the undimmed sacred glory of this emperor, will remain forever preserved. Democracy is uh, it's having a time. Democracy is having a time. A uh, United Caribbean. Oh. Okay, continue... Continue existence. Ah, Jim Maker. Remember last time, in the last episode, we got rid of, uh, well, a certain Jamaican leader. That's all I'm going to say. A certain Jamaican leader. Hey, Alexander Bustamante. Hello. And then we also these guys over here. West Indies Federation. The yeah, original nationalism, minority rights struggle, as well as dreams of unity. We've got quite a bit of political power. I want to use it so badly for political favors, but we're just going to wait because I don't want to lower our uh, power. I mean, over time, I don't mind doing that. But we still have the majority of seats in the House. Well, I'm just going to call it House or whatever it is. Um, so I don't want to lower it any further for now. It just doesn't make any sense for us to. So we're not going to. And we have to save our political power anyway, so might as well save it. Uh, where are we at? 67. Eh, I keep doing naval doctrine because you can. I kind of doubt we'll need it. I don't care. Do that. That's fine. There you go. Do both of these. Oh, whoops. They do the wrong one. Oh, well, I don't really care. Uh, done goofed it up or whatever. Make sure political loyalty. Thank you very much. And get more division organization recovery rate. Increases military supervision, even though we literally have none. And we get the events bygones. Ogawa had heard all the stories, watched all the movies, seen all the posters. All of them had hyped that Imperial Army to a nearly mythological force that swept aside the opposition like leaves. It was the stuff dreams were made out of. If only those dreams hadn't been sucked out of his mind by this miserable existence at their training camp, he might have just taken veterans Khan Miziaki at his word. The Navy ship does just eat to the port. The Australians hadn't been alerted to her arrival, but the Papuans on the island told them soon enough. A gunfight had broken out along the new Bismarck Hill line, and artillery pieces had already begun shelling her positions. Miyazaki kept the room silent, yet Ogawa couldn't help but be disinterested. There was no glory left for him or anyone else in the room. There was barely a half decent food to be found in the whole barracks. Where the F would he find time to win a battle or earn a promotion? Yet the rest of the battalion had yet to arrive along the shoreline. The captain called it in. Suddenly we had the Australians trapped between us and an allied battalion. We made short work of them. Them. The man grinned in a toothy grin as the rest of the Ogawa's class applauded him. It pained him to clap along. An ancient tale for ancient men, he thought. Let the past be the past. The sooner he finished training, the better. Thank you for your time, Mr. Miyazaki. Miyazaki, yeah, Miyazaki. So, 243 out of, 247 out of 233 needed. 83% chance. Uh, was there anything we could do with our government stability? 100%. That's so strong. I don't know. Uh, Japan is still going to get a rework, I've heard. By 2023, the time it's recording, so I could be wrong about that, but... Yeah. Um, yeah. I want to get... I, I want to do this. Ooh, the West African War, nice. But... Getting 1% increase for our faction power is just not worth it. It's not worth spending the political power, especially if we have other stuff to do. So. Nice. 
Um, I mean, we have the support anyways. M military professionalism begins to improve. Hardline relations decrease by 5%, and IJA support decreases as well. So, decreases power. Okay, interesting. Just good to know. 0 to 39. Oh. An alliance of pragmatic distrust. We accept your proposal, Ambassador. Let's discuss further details. We're now involved in West Africa. Control of the Gulf of Gu Guinea. Guinea will be pivotal towards our ability to field troops in the West African pay A the P A L F. Oh, I don't know we get involved here. Uh, shipments. Oh crap. Ground support vehicles. Hmm. Send oil shipments. Uh. Um. Okay. Armored insurgencies. Send military advisors. Air vehicles. Niger, Ghana, and Guinea. Let's see. Ghana's right here. West African Alliance. Pan-African Liberation Front. I'm kind of glad we kept our uh, political power here, then. Mm -hmm. How do we successfully defend in the Gulf of Guinea? Do we need to send soldiers there? Cameroon is not an ideal ally. They're distrustful, displaying questionable ideologies. Are internally unstable, and their ambitions of pan-Africanism are dangerous yet. Even if they dislike us, they hate the Western colonialists even more. If we want to deny a powerful OFM pawn, the Cameroon must be supported. We can't do anything with them, though. Um, Cameroon is African state? I mean, I don't mind giving them stuff. That's fine with me, but... Uh... Planes are not bad. I want to do this one, because that looks pretty good. African Continental Army? Ooh, minus 70%. Oh, minus 70%. What do they have here? I've never done this before, so. Pan-African Vanguard looks really cool. Tense borders. Political rivalry sucks. Continental Army. They lost recovery rate. Planning. Max planning. And land auction research rate is pretty bad, too. Negative 25% planning. They already have negative 75%, though. Um, land auction speed. Armor insurgents. Well, I mean, this one seems probably best to do, maybe. And what is this one? Dahomey. Army organization regain attrition. Uh, we'll do two. We'll do two. We'll see what happens. Uh, do we want to send our navy over here? Does that, will that do anything? I kind of doubt it. I guess send the ships out and see what we can do. Maybe. Um, build up ports. Oh. Our operational capacity in West Africa will be greatly expanded. It becomes possible to expand equipment and shipments to the PALF. Large increase of series advantage. Build up Cameroonian ports. Conduct more naval operations. Transfer helicopters. Naval helicopters. Wow. We'll escalate. Retrofit Cameroonian ships. Uh, I don't know. We still have the bell in the die, which is nice. Build up ports, I guess. Retrofit the ships. I guess? I don't know. I've never done this before. I'm glad we already did this up over here. I don't have to worry about it too much at all now, but still. 1.85, roughly two a day is actually pretty darn good. None of our ships are over here. Are you getting over there? Are you still getting over there? I want to send volunteers. Why can't we just go to Africa, man? Let me get directly involved. I want to send volunteers. Oil shipments? No. Our convoys are not being harassed. Well, how can you tell they're being harassed? Well, let me close out of that stuff for now. Secure the Gulf. Secure the Gulf? I mean, what do you mean? The, the Gulf is secured. We can do convoy escorts. Do we have to do something like this to here to here? Do we need to do all the way from the islands of like like this? Is that what we have to do? Oh, that's not good. This makes literally no sense. We just build the ports maybe first. Uh, I don't know. We don't have that big of a military either, but this doesn't make any sense. I might do some funky stuff off screen. Maybe we'll see what happens. Uh, also, is there anything else here regarding, like, Navy stuff? We did one... Yeah, well, there you go. Expand dockyards. That's completed. Floating air base is not completed within 10 days. Which would be completed in 4 days. That's fine. You have to do two at a time, so... 
are also the most responsible. In his evaluation and examinations of the possible consequences of his plan, Takeo Fukuda has suffered a significant setback. Most of administration's pains, a simple tax bureau audit has uncovered Mitsui, and Mitsubishi's complicity and involvement in corrupt skimmings directly linked to the offshore subsidies of Yasuda. Ascending shockwaves throughout our financial administration of the crisis, this new revelation indicates that there are many more to blame for our recent economic crises. The corruption of malpractice is systematic and will require far more effort in deconstructing and organizing the collapse. Perhaps the worst news for us, Kishi's hardliners expecting to latch onto this report and fuel their agenda with claims of the government favoritism. And corporate negligence, of course. Now, 4%, huh? It's poor. It's still good. 247. And the bill will hopefully pass. Nice job, guys. They passed? Good one. Good. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Politically convenient pardons. Fukuda's mastermind delivers us to wiser schemes once again. His excellent manipulation and negotiation and appeal to the industrial conglomerates, alongside the donning of the financial ministry's corporate gu guillotines and its proposals, has constructed a new initiative in handling the implicated firms. Fukuda suggests we prom promise amnesty to the mega corporations in return for the subscription to a government advised recovery plan. Despite the resounding resonance within the government, members of the Ministry of Commerce issue their protest. They insist that this plan, if followed, is nothing but backing down and rolling over in the face of the obscenities in corporate. Uh, of corporate corruption. The cause and divert course grow unruly. It seems, despite our best efforts, they will hear they will remember this objection. Also, since we're down lower a little bit more, uh, more technical credit relations. It's still good. We want to keep increasing that though. Imperial Army coup. That's not good. A drink in Cameroon. Saiji placed a stack of beige files on the desk, and the Cameroonian officer worker glanced up to the stoic Japanese administrator. Clearly unsure what to do with his papers, tell him, he told the Cameroon man beside him. Abba has who had been also acting as a translator as of late. No translator was a loaded term, considering the man barely understood Japanese still. It was enough. Abba nodded and explained what they were to do to his office worker, who nodded and took him away. There were still more packages and papers to drop off, so Saiji and Abba continued down the rest of the building, where the same process was repeated. It was far from efficient, and not speaking the same language was a problem, but it was done. Now they had at least two more buildings to repeat the same process at. The rides were often silent, since neither of them knew the language of, of the other to hold a conversation. It would be awkward if the awkwardness was not so normal. It seemed to be a common thing. Neither the Cameroonians nor the Japanese really wanted to be here, but pragmatism brought and kept them closer together. Still, the more he worked with them, the more he found Abba's presence tolerable. He couldn't do his job without him and didn't fill up the room every second with pointless chatter. They had an unspoken system, which was perhaps not the best, but it worked, and they had little ritual at the end of the day. It was a little bar they went to at the end of the shift. The side of a Japanese man had drawn some stairs the first time, but no longer. Now that two men sharing a drink at the end of the workday was commonplace, perhaps some thought it was strange that neither man talked, but Saiji preferred it that way. And he suspected Abba felt the same. Bonding happens in the strangest of places. So if, it, if we continue to escalate it, can we get involved? Uh, we need to get involved. I don't understand. Successfully defending the Gulf. What do you mean, defending the Gulf? The Gulf is 100% def defended. And we're going to escalate, escalate, escalate as best we possibly can. While still trying to uh, supply air vehicles. Well, that'd be nice and all, but still. Uh, transfer naval helicopters? Convoys are not being, are not being harassed now. I, I kind of want to do it to see what happens, but... We're going to escalate it. Screw it. Screw the political power. Actually, we didn't lose that much. Was it five when we lost? Or maybe it was 20. I can't tell. I don't remember. Secure the Gulf of Guinea? I mean, we're doing the best we can. I don't want to fail it. It goes Ghana. Uh, if this doesn't go well for us, then I'm going to do some funky stuff. Because I want to see if we can actually do this. I want to see what happens if we actually win. Because I've never done it if we've done actually won before. So There's that. Yeah. How are we looking here? We're, remember, 266 is still pretty good. Public support is still pretty high, too. It's not bad. Free France, huh? De Gaulle still exists. 12 divisions, 13. Oh, they're pretty close. Pretty close together, actually. Not bad. Um... I don't want to give them air vehicles. I mean, that'd be nice and all, but it doesn't mean they're going to use them. But a letter, letter from Siberia. At the height of the non, at noon, a letter arrived at the office of the Imperial Foreign Minister. It had been delivered by one of the diplomats who hailed from that strange Siberian kingdom, of which the minister still oddly, knew oddly little about. Upon opening the envelope, he realized that the letter was addressed to the Emperor, and explicitly not to him. He returned it into the envelope and decided against carrying it to the Emperor personally. Better not bother with such tri trivialities. Besides, he would like to read more of it, and he would have not been, and he would have had it not been so awfully written and in Russian. And so he found a translator who might be able to read this appalling work easier than he had. Yet the translator struggled enormously with this task. The phrases were muddled, and the word choices bizarre, and the punctuation non-existent. 
As a try as he might, he could not decipher what was written. He even began to question whether it had been written in some other foreign language. He had not heard of. But the only part he could definitely decode was the name of the sign at the bottom. Rook II, Tsar and Autocrat of all Rus. The foreign minister turned to the translator and asked, Why did the madman send that? Why? A private meeting. Kaya and Aoki uh, followed Fukuda to his office, which, unfortunate, which fortunately wasn't too far from where the regular cabinet meetings were held. Fukuda closed the door behind the trio and pulled a series of folders and documents out of a drawer of his desk. Kaya spoke up. You requested us to follow you after your cabinet meeting. What requires such privacy? Fukuda looked up from his combing through the documents and replied, You were right. After the tax bureaus informed us to sell their audits of the surviving Sabatsus, we discovered all of them had offshore dealings. Mitsubishi, Mitsui, Sumitomo. All of them are using subsidiaries of Yusuda to offshore their revenues and dodge Japanese taxes. Kai and Aoki glanced at each other. If what Fukuda said was true, then this is a major revelation and a dangerous one. Aoki was quick to ask, so where was all that potential tax revenue sent? Fukuda quickly responded. It all went straight into the executive's pockets in the Navy. Kai rubbed his forehead, muttering, this is perfect for Kishi. The others, uh, reluctant, uh, the others nodded reluctantly. The hardliners <clears throat> had repeatedly claimed that the Zaibatsus weren't more trouble than they were worth, and these audits would only embolden them. Kai didn't want to play into their hands, but it looked like pressuring the Zaibatsus into giving concessions was the only option left at the point. Ignoring these audits could create an even worse disaster in the court of public opinion. Nothing is ever as simple as it seems around here. The hand that feeds. The government and the Zaibatsus are in a state of mutual reliance. We need them to prevent further economic downturn and maintain stability in the economy, while they also need us to maintain their fortunes and stay afloat in the aftermath of the economic wars. Confrontation and conflict between the two would only lead to Japan and our economy being, and people being plunged into further ruin. No, there is a far smarter way of dealing with these companies, one which will serve or both preserve economic health and cripple their power. Finance Minister Fukuda has proposed a bill for corporate stabilization, in actuality, a treaty between the state and the Zaibatsu. Should the bill be passed, the government will offer a conditional bailout package to the Zaibatsu in exchange for subsidies, tax relief, and loans. Government observers will be appointed to the boards of directors, and nominally to measure firm performance and work with the Zaibatsu to ensure growth and stability and truth. This mechanism will also be used to exert control over the com companies and threaten them into submission if, if necessary. Still building up the ports, I guess. See what happens. Beautiful Ghana. Uh, but after keep going through some of this stuff first, let's see. 68. Nope, not good enough yet. Anything here? Maybe, maybe not. Yes, please. Hidemi gripped the interior wall of the helicopter with one hand. Feed and camera in the others. He snapped pictures of the ground hundreds of feet below the machine crawling through the skies above Ghana. The ground slowly slipping past him was verdant and lush with vegetation, grass, brush, plants, and squat trees covered in sloped hills speckled with patches of forest climbing up sheer cliff faces or gathering at the feet of mountains. The all-conquering noise of the propellers and engine did not bother Hidemi, the a young journalist tasked with documenting the state of war and the beauty of West Africa in photos and spirits in print. The landscape was occasionally broken up by frontline camps. The remnants of battles were small towns as they passed one such camp. He watched as an ant-sized PALF a soldier glanced over the helicopter and offered a cheerful way before being beckoned back to work by Superior. Hidemi took care to snap a picture before that happened. The pilot, a man named Aritomo, had just become relatively close to Hidemi, but had been silent most of the journey, abruptly asked a question. How do you think this whole mess is going to end? Uh, well, things are going to look pretty good for the PLF, said Hidemi, as he snapped a photo of the charred carcass of a tank, sitting derelict in a field long since abandoned after some ill-fated charge of defense. If they do win, it'll be a win for all of us. Liberation is a goal, isn't it? Well, from what I think I've seen, I think victory is almost a given, but I don't think it's going to be pleasant as you think it is, nor will it be as glamorous as your newspaper will claim it is. Well, even if they don't join the sphere, they'll be free. That's not what I meant by glamorous. Oh. Continue escalation. Nice. I love it. Just keep escalating conflicts. If people die, then people die. And as long as they're not our people, it's okay with us. I should give them more stuff, but we got we literally have to keep our political power here, which sucks. Love to help you out, man. Is it worth doing that? I want to build up more ports. Let's see what happens. Let's apply to the PIL up with Stan. Pan African Liberation Front. West African Alliance. Yeah, we'll see. I might do some funky stuff here, but, you know. As long as no one's really winning too hard. Build up the ports. I want to see what happens. After 14 days. 4.8% growth. That's really good. I mean, we went. It's slowly going up. I mean, deficit's still pretty bad. Don't get me wrong. We're spending a lot on the army. That's a bit ridiculous. Not going to lie. 1.5%. Not too bad. Just keep growing that economy. Just grow, 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 grow. We're growers, not showers. Um, good. We're going to keep expanding uh, relations with the technocrats for now as well. 4%, 1% political papers. Demand. Oh, demand fines for corruption. Oh. If not selected. Oh. If we select, we get more political power. We lose stability. Increase liquid reserves. 
But Hardland relations would go up. I mean, we could do it. We gained about two fines. That'd be nice, actually, to get a little more liquid reserves. But it's only 0.5 billion. You know, that's 75 more political power. That's actually really strong. But you know what? We're not. Gonna, I'm not going to click at this entire campaign. 1.86 still not too bad. Okay, station at Hammer Task Force. Direct more naval operations. Oh, that's only command power, too. Large increase of spheres advantage in the Gulf of Guinea campaign. Significantly escalate. That's fine. Retrofit their ships. Ah, oh, screw you anyways. Because now we're going to have like, no political power, which sucks. But whatever. Oh, well. 68. Yes, please. The Type 27. Yes, yes, yes. The hand that feeds. Because this one increased relations, actually, and decreased hardland influence. So, lower the temperature. The air was noticeably cool and crisper in Karuizawa. Then in Tokyo, even inside a ho windowless hotel conference room. Minister of Finance Fukuda was grateful to be liberated from the urge to wipe his balding brow before his guests. It helped maintain a ne necessary gravitas. Publicly, it was a coincidence that the heads of the Mitsubishi and Mitsui were in Karuizua, Karuizawa on the same day. Plenty of rich and famous maintained estates in the mountain resort, and they might occasionally fancy a meal out. And similarly, Though Weiss SK periodically rented out hotels for party functions, Fukuda's attendance was quite unremarkable. Of course, the fact that all three men would be in the same room was, room was extraordinary, but that was private by Fukuda's design. As soon as the Mitsubishi and Mitsui executives were seated, Fukuda opened the meeting brusquely before they could even sip the steaming cups of tea before them. Gentlemen, I'm afraid the tax bureaus discovered irregularities in both their company's records. I'm told they link you both to the Yasuda scandal. These preposterous allegations are beyond impertinent, the Mitsubishi had bristled. I demand to see evidence. Which we have, Fukuda countered, but giving it over would mean opening illegal proceedings. Is that really so wise when the public is agitated? Everyone fell silent. Fukuda continued. Uh, the Ministry of Finance realizes that this could be a clerical error. We are willing to settle this matter as such if you can promise your assistance with the government's economic program. It was only the, the only deal that they would get, and they, of course, knew it. And the feeds... Corporate uh, modernized, or corporatism modernized. Uh, modus vivendi has been achieved between the state and business. Reluctant or not, the once all consuming power of the Zaibatsu has been curbed, that of the bureaucracy and state ascending to what it ought to be, and we've taken a big step towards economic harmony, a new order in the Japanese economy's dom, one of the growth and stability above all else, discarding the myoptic demands of the military, winding of fickle partisan act politicians, and the corruption of corporate executives, and one which will secure for us for the best of future. The best future. And if you're wondering about fear and loathing in LA, please go right ahead, but. A big step, this may be, but this is one but one step on the road to true corporatism. The perfect concord of all actors in the economy, all working together for the common good. Society and the economy is perfectly as efficient as a well-oiled machine. This is the technocratic dream, our dream. More growth and inflation will decrease as well. Oh, say it so. Armaments, ooh. You know what? We're going to do whatever we can to help these guys out. Now, they might not do anything for us, but whatever. Nothing down there, too. Good. Yeah, that's not bad. 4.7%. I mean, we should get higher. Death to GDP ratio is, is slowly getting stagnant. <laughs> it's already stagnant. Why is this green now? I mean, it usually means green we have a surplus, but not in this case. My god, I wish we could cut this down. We could cut it down, but I'm going to save our political power for what we have right now, so. We're taking a crap, so yeah. Honestly, 258 is already really good. It's already really good. We can use relations by 5%. We don't need to spend it right now. We already have 258. We already have 258. It's so strong. we got to keep the political power that we have currently. And we have no oil. But don't look at that. Um, we have 1,000 transport helicopters. That's actually really nice. we got plenty of stuff here to use. So ramp up naval patrols. Okay. Happy 1968, everybody. Hope you're having a wondrous year. 4.8% growth. Transcript. Imperial Diet Plenary Session, 1968. Minister of Finance, Fukuda. The Corporate Stabilization Act may appear to be throwing good money after bad. We are fully aware of the gen general public suspicion towards the Zaibatsu after Yasuda's collapse, but having witnessed the damage of said collapse, it is the utmost importance that the flow of money in the economy and confidence be restored as soon as possible. In exchange for safe funds, the government has secured agreements with Mitsubishi, Mitsui, and Sumitomo that they will promote the development of the Empire's economy as dictated by the government policy. And may I remind you that this government priorities or this government's priority is to ensure the fruits of economic growth are now spread tangibly to the Empire's subjects in roads, power plants, schools, and hospitals. This is the only way public trust can enter a system of governance, uh, which has served us since before the war, will be maintained. Takagi, Sotkichi, MP. 
I asked the government, how is this any different from the state-directed economic planning that created a conduit of graft leading up to the Prime Minister's office? A letter touched, the Minister says, to me, this looks like half measures. Shini Estusisabaru, MP, how does the Minister expect the people to trust in her leadership by rewarding those who defrauded them? Our priority must be to punish those who subvert the needs of the state and the people for selfish gain, and to reorient the economy once again towards a common goal, the advancement and prosperity of our empire. The reformists and the hardliners had their say, but fell on deaf ears because they mean nothing. 258 out of 233? Awesome. We even have two reformers supporting us here. 221, 221, 21, 9, 2, and 5. I can add sometimes. So if we do this one, business taxes will go even further down, but increase our GDP by 4 flippin' billion. And we're going to read next one. We can't do old bureaucrats just because we need corporatism. Modern, oh, wait. No, we can do this one. We need to complete Aoki's bureaucratic revival to go this way, which would be nice. Uh, but Aoki's bureaucratic revival. Wait, where's that one? Uh, not this one. Oh, it's over here. Okay, so we need to... Okay, that's, that's weird. We need to go this one. Not, 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 not necessarily what for net. But you have to complete this one for this one. So if you don't read about this one, please go right ahead. But we'll complete and read A Cautious Path for the Future. The very foundation of the Japanese economy has reached a very stable position. The worst excesses of our debt spirals, as well as having the worst ending economic statistics, has been blunted, and we can finally begin to surgically diagnose and treat inefficiencies in a recession where they lay. Some may call it success, but others recognize that we are entering a new world of struggle and trial. The conservatives in the home ministry, alongside Kishi's faction of hardliners, are displeased with their lack of initiative in seizing a greater role in this for the state in the economic troubles of the empire. It seems that they circle our every decision like hyenas, awaiting their movement to capitalize on anything they see as a government failure. One thing is for sure, though. Entering the next newest stage of economic recovery, we must be cautious in ex executing our government's plans. Inflation will decrease, hardline relations will decrease, but we don't care about that, and we get a whole nother event. Turning a quarter. Retail sales, steel production, stock prices, all indicators for the Zaibatsu have been up, on the, on the, up for the past month. Aoki turned over the last page of the cabinet's economic report with a contented sigh. I'm cautiously optimistic. We've turned the quarter. Kai nodded approvingly, leaning back in his seat to look at the scene outside the Prime Minister's official residence. The crosswalk in front of the front gate had, had returned to life, with the unceasing rumble of car engines framing the sight of men and women patiently waiting at the traffic light. The midday sunlight suffused Kai's office, bathing its occupants in a lazy light. An entirely normal day, placid day, for the first time in a very long time. The Zabatus are cooperating with their audits. If we cross his legs in the seat, tapping his hand idly on the armrest, no more talk of hostile takeovers or retrenchment, the money's starting to flow again. Well done, Kaz said publicly, or plainly, allowing his praise to settle in the room. Hopefully they realize that their, little, that their time is better spent following state guidance rather than squabbling amongst themselves. The three nodded, savoring their victory, before turning their eyes to the next batch of folders on the table before them. Agricultural statistics, factory throughput, employment statistics, the real work of the economy itself on the outside world or the world outside of Tokyo's rarefied financial district, the livelihood of the Empire's subjects still remain unaddressed. The work remains unfinished in due diligence. Kameda Ma Masayoshi felt a spring in his step as he stepped into the elevator, having slept soundly for the first time in months, securing funds, slashing costs, burying secrets, reassuring Mitsui's investors that all would come to an end, now that the government was coming to rescue at last. Maybe he would be even be able to see Sayochi Sachio at home over dinner, rather than in the office lobby holding his change of clothes. She'd be threatening to take the children back to the countryside. Get out of the way, if you're free, hurry up and get the rest of the files you want. Kamada froze as an unfamiliar suited man bellowed at him, as the elevator doors opened, pushing two employees holding cardboard boxes inside. He opened his mouth to shout back, who the heck do you think you are? But the man had already hurried away, yelling at a beleaguered secretary further down the hall. The scene was no less hectic in his office, with space occupied by a cadre of unfamiliar men haughtily haranguing his subordinates, reducing them to running errands. Kamada's deputy scurried over with an apologetic bow. Ministry of Finance audit, sir, the government is demanding a full accounting of our operations and they're going to bail us out. Kamada pushed past men, his footsteps hastening as he approached his desk. The drawers were all removed, their contents strewn across the floor, all files of value taken, including the ones he'd kept hidden from his deputy. Kamada felt a tap on his shoulder, sending his heart plunging, plunging into his stomach. General Manager Kamada, we have a few questions. And of course, I did read before we faded and fade out the cautious path of the future, so now we've got to focus on the right side. Armor, next generation, a ready navy. Uh, it probably be best, because this one we lose political power, so I want to save that one for last. Let's do a ready navy and then do review our armor. Though our navy is already capable of making any of our rivals tremble at the thought of engaging it, the advantages we hold are at risk of slipping away. New threats loom on the horizon as our enemies struggle to meet our might. We must move decisively to ensure our hegemony in the Pacific can be challenged or even overthrown. Naval modernization is fast becoming of existential importance. A couple comments included. Uh, yeah, I will do other Japanese routes sometime. That's, that was the main comment, like, Ikeda, Takagi again. 
uh, just other routes for Japan. We'll see what happens. I'm not sure what's going to exactly happen, but I do want to see what happens with securely Gulf of Guinea. So, and also apparently, at the time of recording, Older Blues has been updated, and there's like a Doki Doki submod for it. That sounds really cool too, though. But yeah, we failed. Uh, not sure what else we can do there. But the continent's looking okay. F over five percent growth. Debt interest not bad. Of course, we still have a deficit of about thirteen billion. But you know, whatever. We don't talk about that. Send African equipment or equipment to the African states. We got a little bit of stuff here. Why not? They can have some stuff. We'll have command power. That's not really a concern of ours. And other than that, we still have two hundred forty-six MPs. Not bad. Heavy missile ship focus. Very very cool. And happy April, everybody. Hope you're having a great great month. Let's see. What do we have here? Uh, battle groups. Yes, please. Uh, economy, not bad, like we said earlier. And how is this looking? So right now we have 277, which is pretty good. In total, 100% government stability, which is kind of ridiculous, but that's nice. Africa's slowly starting to fall apart. East African Federation. And I will play as a mandate someday. I don't think they actually still have any way to, for them to successfully survive. But, splinters. What's we'll to choose the next one. Prime Minister Kyle watched from behind the podium as his cabinet ministers delivered their work reports to the assembled technocratic faction of the YSK. Their voices augmented so as to be audible in the bank packed banquet hall. After his own initial remarks, and indeed after most of the minister's statements, a wave of polite applause rippled through the crowd as if on cue. The minor ministries were uncontroversial, and the crowd bided their time until the real power players emerged. The government is confident that a judicious fiscal policy as a means to incentivize economic activity is the key to an economic revival in the post yasuda crisis, or period. As Okuda, the Minister of Finance, wrapped up his prepared speech, Shina Atsua Saboru, the hardliner's front man, was on his feet within a rebuttal. An economic revival means nothing and those responsible for the Eno crash to suffer no punishment. Shina missed no words in his criticism. By rewarding bad actors, the people will lose even more faith in the Empire's politics. The system needs to be built, not reset. The hardliners surrounding him made their own dissatisfaction, dissatisfaction clear. A chorus of disgruntled heckles and aggravated or grieved a sense of Sheena's words. The other members of the technocratic faction stared them down with steely gr glares, and their air bristled with tension before Kai raised his own voice. Gentlemen, this is a discussion of means, not ends. Would anyone be happy to see Takagi's liberals emasculate the empire, or the corruption and privilege of the conservatives and the Kitoites go unchecked? The hardliners remain a thorn in our side, but review our armor. The Imperial Japanese Army is a fierce and deadly fighting force operating from the highlands of Burma to the Manchurian Plains. It's almost universally respected, as much as it is feared, mostly by those unwilling to challenge its dominance over Asia, however. Our armed forces, or armed corps, are certainly lacking compared to that of our German and American rivals. Even the long dead Soviet Union had better designs than us before its destruction. If we remain a competitive force in our fight to defend Asia and the co prosperity sphere from the skulking American menace, the perfidious influence of the madmen in Germania, or seditious radicals from Manila to Mukden, we are left with no other alternative. Our tanks and armor divisions must be a modern standard to compete with the global cutting edge. At least, or less, we give away our future, the future of Asia, to our enemies. Unauthorized to go slow action. Anything else down here? Send military advisors? Yeah, that looks pretty good. Gave them some definite defense and uh, maybe a little more attack. Nice. Definitely, definitely, definitely. Unauthorized go slow action. A disruption on the Kyoto Sen is beginning to draw an unfortunate amount of attention. Train drivers, apparently. Oh, frustrated by lack of responsiveness? Uh, uh, I think I did. I think I read this one before earlier. So if you want to read about unauthorized go slow action, please go right ahead. Uh, this is about truckers just killing themselves, so. Or train drivers. Unfortunately, our investigations have so far failed to make any progress in covering who their backers might be. Darn it. So if you want to read this again, please go ahead. But we have a lot of stability already, so it's pretty nice. We get plus 0 0.3 every week, too. Why is that? Public approval. Oh! Okay, so that makes sense. Government stability, I guess. It gives, so that's what it gives us. I didn't know that it gave us that. My bad. I was complaining in like, the earlier this episode or, you know, past couple episodes about that, but whatever. Our insurgencies? Ah, screw what we can do anyways. Why not? Probably shouldn't be spending all this political power, but hey, hey you never know what's going to happen. Actually, some of you guys might know what's going to happen. I don't. I'll do that anyways because we can. Better support equipment? Not bad, not bad. We're doing pretty good on tanks too, so... Um, nuclear sub? Super Yamato hull? Yes. Or class? Yes. Yes, please. And now, Happy May, everybody. Happy, Happy May. Only the best equipment. God, I wish we could send divisions. I really wish we could. Yeah, nothing really there, so... A ready navy, armor, minus 0.24% poverty rate change, not bad. Widespread corruption, oh, yes please. And after this one, go to here, we'll get, what is it? 15% more daily political power, that'll be nice, especially when we're going to lose 0.1 right here too. As well as 0.25 more, which is going to suck. 
Suck. Suck. But experts say no. Prime Minister Kai, I'm Takagi Sokichi, representing Komamoto's, Komamoto's 4th District. Today, I stand here to deliver my concern about the Greater East Asian Naval Dominance or Defense Program Bill. I do not disagree that the Army-Navy cooperation is vital for the defense of the sphere and its people. However, upon careful revisiting this bill, I, together with the Naval Minister of Fukuchita and Admiral Ganda, feel convinced that the promotion of such cooperation is truly the government's intention and the likely result of this bill. As a former military man, I, along with many others who served in the Imperial Navy, fail to see how inter-service coordination will be improved by civilian liaisons with likely no service record or by mandatory monthly reports to the HOR Defense Committee. It is the consensus of the Imperial Navy that such measures are nothing but bureaucratic and red tapes that do no good, and that true inter-service coordination can only be improved by communication between the services free from extra interference by civilian government. Earlier today, Minister Fuchida has expressed the Navy's willingness to work with the Army Chief of Staff, and he expects this, that this effort, on the Navy's own initiative and independent from the government's bill, will work out well. Unless the government consults the Imperial Navy in revising this bill, I shall respectfully decline to support the bill proposed by the government. That old dude. And now we need to do the armor stuff. It's fine, whatever. We were going to do anyways. Uh, I've not done a single thing of political favors here. It, it seems okay. And we get, like, free buildings, but it costs us stuff. It costs us influence. I, there's no point to do it. Yeah, I get dockyards, building slots. It's not bad. But... I don't see any penalty to do it yet, either. I mean, political favors are good and all, but we don't get anybody to help invest in us, too, so... Or vote for us if we do those, so... Alright, so we have 246 out of 233 needed, 83%. And we do, don't do this one. Our government's ability to increase by 10, 20%. Wow. Increase the minimum naval funding. Well, that sucks. Anything else for these guys? Oh, well, actually, doing maybe a little better. I didn't do anything yet for these guys, either, so... There. Have some more equipment, that's fine, 1.86. And then, sweat into munitions. The Emperor's peace secured after the Greater East Asia War may have been fought over by armed forces, but it was won with the sacrifices of our civilian population. Years of blood, sweat, and tears were smelted into the very fibers of wartime production to finally push out the imperialists and plunderers from Asia. However, we have grown complacent and fat off the spoils of war, and this peace is to remain. We must work harder, smarter, and more efficiently. Every and all military formations on land and air and seas must be supplied with every munition they will ever need. Every hand must be on deck. There are no excuses for the Empire's armed forces to be lagging behind, unable to support her friends and allies from the Bay of Bengal to Korea. I don't want to lose any more political power, though. Docking output's not bad. Uh, Docking output's not bad, but we're, we're, at least for now, we're looking okay. Yeah, actually, holy crap, how are they doing so well? We just gave them some extra stuff. Crab wave? No. African Continental Army, Japanese military. Oh, yeah, that definitely helps out. General Sun Diang Ying is arrested. Sun Diang Ying is relieved after the just field 76 had let him go some days prior. He made a note to himself to stay out of the way of secret police in the future, especially now that he would soon be retiring still. Yeah, he had been released and relieved of this burden of the suspicions, at least in official capacity. It was not as if further inter interrogations would yield nothing more. They had nothing on him, and it would continue that way. As he sat by the window smoking a deep cigarette, or cheap cigarette, he wondered if any of his colleagues would also be interrogated still. The matter was over for him, thus not worth troubling himself too much with. It is therefore came as a great surprise to the General Sutton, after opening the door to his apartment, to be greeted by the sight of three officers of the Kent by Tai and a particularly nervous translator. Without as much as a faint gesture of respect for the military rank, he was grabbed and handcuffed by two of the Kent by Tai agents, while the third read off a number of charges they had brought against him. Old General Sun Diang Ying was certainly shoved back into the featureless truck, while the Chinese translator did his best to relay the news to him. While Sun was sure he made nothing on him, just like with Just Field 76, he couldn't help but feel like he would be taken in for the rather longer this time. It didn't take long for the Chinese authorities to notice Sun's arrest and disappearance into the bowels of the Kenpatai's local department. Most troubling, though, was the, was the lack of any explanation for the actions of the Japanese agents, who had simply descended upon the ge old general's quiet apartment complex without as much as a phone call to any authority in China. A demand for transparency was in order, and it would be coming straight from the general staff of the ROC. To see the colleague treated in such a manner was a striking insult, and regardless of what overruling authority the Kenpatai might have within the sphere, they had a dangerous line which could not go ignored. Why didn't they alert anybody? And they're zero and zero, which is fine. The next generation. That's a masterpiece. General Hongo seemed almost lost for words, at least to Amari's eye. But he had good reason to be. The Type 21 Chi Ru was truly a tank for the modern age. The trial run in so far was proving very successful. With this vehicle, we can finally match the Americans and Germans in the field, Hongo exclaimed, wildly smiling. I all remember meeting the researchers. The best suspension Japan can offer, one of them had told him. The most powerful gun it can rip apart any bunker in any tank, another had said. The steering is the speed. You'll be most impressed with what we have cooked up, General Amari. The commander told him, and he had been right. He watched as five of the Chirus lined up. Each of them fired, one after another, at a mock enemy 500 meters away. Each shell mashed, smashed, 
through the dummy tank, slamming into the hill behind, but that was not all. The tanks were loaded in quick succession, and fired shot after shot at, at a speed Amari had not thought possible. Each tank hit their mark five times over. General Hongo seemed on the verge of tears after the final shell hit the mock targets. What are you thinking, Hongo? That certainly reached, that's, that's a certain research team needs a pay raise. A very, very large pay raise. Japan has caught up. ROC General Staff demands explanation. Now wishing to waste any more time, the while the Kempai Tai continued to violate not only a significant number of laws and treaties, but also the dignity of the Chinese army, the ROC General Staff gathered in the early morning to force the issue to a swift conclusion. As they sat around an office made hazy by a mixture of cigarette smoke after some hours of discussion, it was decided that a telegram would be sent straight to the very top, to the Prime Minister of Japan. The General Staff would demand an answer to the two questions relating to General Sun's capture. Firstly, why the Kenpai Tai decided to overrule the thorough and sound interrogation conducted by Just Field 76. Secondly, why they decided to abduct the general without as much as a word to the proper authorities, most importantly, the ROC general staff itself. The telegram concluded with a request that should any wrongdoing be discovered that the generals be allowed to deal with it. The message was then quickly dispatched after being marked as a distinctly urgent one. Most of the general staff elected to wait for a response, rather than retire to bed and risk finding the situation grown ever more appalling. When a reply from the Prime Minister did not arrive after several hours, the general staff were left with two possibilities as to what was occurring in Tokyo. Either the Japanese were still floundering for an appropriate answer to send back to them, or that the Prime Minister had simply decided to ignore their demands outright. That is quite troubling. Definitely don't want to do this one. Um, uh, some models... Ooh, struck anywhere. After, many twists their necks and widen their eyes to witness the screams of jet engines zip over the towns and cities, such as the power of the Japanese air forces. In our past, air power proved decisive when battling the British and the Americans throughout the Greater East Asia War. Like a divine wind, our airmen were able to strike a given target with an inferno of firepower and withdrawn in good order to organize once more. Let us build upon this tradition of excellence in design and training, utilizing the greatest minds in military engineering and theory, so that we may construct an air force the world shall fear. Our enemies from Orom Ki to Utsunomiya will flee and scatter, covering their heads and ears upon sight of our jet engine weapons of war, hunting from the skies, none shall obey the aquiline precision of the Empire's air forces. China demands an explanation, of course. Oh, 72, 233. Ooh, that's not good. Uh, previous relations, we can do that once. Yes, 247, not bad. And where are we for this? 44% is pretty nice, too. Um, yeah, not bad. No need to spend there. Actually, all the armed forces. 87.5. Uh, zero paranoia. I'm not sure that mechanic's working, but I'm not going to concern myself with that. They demand an explanation, of course. <clears throat> the telegram sent by the general staff of the ROC arrived at the code tie, just in time for the Prime Minister's breakfast. After passing through a number of security checks, the telegram itself was delivered alongside the usual selection plates, cups, and other crockery. As the Prime Minister read through the message between the sips of green tea, a look of frank confusion, followed by severe concern, spread across his face. He had, of course, heard of General Sun's previous arrest and subsequent unfruitful interrogation by Jessica 76, leading him to believe that the man would be faded away into retirement. Therefore, as the news of his sudden and almost all mysterious second arrest by the Kenpai Tai was nothing short of extremely troubling. The matter was now worse by the fact that the ROC general staff were demanding answers and actions on the Prime Minister's part, and they had seemingly been aware of the issue even before himself. Breakfast ended rather quickly, or quicker than usual, as the Prime Minister rushed off to contact the Home Minister. As he had no explanation as to the matter either, he demanded that it be investigated immediately. In the meantime, he would send off some vague promise of a forthcoming documentation of the son's arrest. As the rush job of a reply was sent back to Nanjing, the Prime Minister was left with the th thought that the answer the Chinese general staff was seeking would be far more complex than anticipated. If we knew anything, we'd tell you already. And also, we're building about 10 refiners just because we get a daily 4.200, even though we're spending 15,000 fuel, so, yeah. The whole minister's initial report. But the Prime Minister attempting to keep the ROC General Staff distracted with the promises of a soon to be delivered explanation of General Sun's arrest, it was up to the Home Minister to formalize a report that would hopefully rectify the increasingly concerning matter. After some dubious reluctance on the part of the Kempai Tai station in Nanjing, the Home Minister was finally able to require a copy of the report. The initial section of the documents explained that Sun had been pre arrested following the Kempai Tai's dissatisfaction with the previous efforts of the Justice Field 76. Following paragraphs detailing the pressing urgency of acquiring proper information from the old general with fears that the wider issues being examined by the Kenpai Tai might grow out of control, the Home Minister found himself more confused than ever, yet there were still more documents to examine. Sun, as it turned out, was only a small part of something much larger in scale, while the Japanese Secret Service had naturally dedicated much of their time to eradicating any traces of the potential Chinese resistance from the ROC. They had in recent months began to focus on potential infiltration of the Japanese army. Sun's arrest was an attempt to find a link between the resistance and any Japanese officers that might have become compromised in some capacity. With this revelation now in the hands of the Home Minister, he opted to immediately deliver his report to the Prime Minister in person. As expected, the Prime Minister was deeply concerned with the developments. There was little solace. Um, 
to be added knowing that the situation in China might be truly disastrous. The Prime Minister can only hope that the Kent by Tai prove more forthcoming with information in the future. As Home Minister exited his office, he can only stare at the document presented before him, hoping that the characters on the paper might materialize into a solution. Troubling, to say the least. Cameroon is still doing relatively okay. How are you guys doing? Pan-African insurgents, nice. Uh, what do they have? Military administration, of course. Uh, American military advisor. Oh, they have that too, okay. And then, stable fronts. Spirit of the French Republic. But, from the Valley of the Dead. The sun was fading. The shadows got longer and longer until beams shining through the windows created silhouettes on the ground that were outlandishly high. Like beasts and a shadow puppet show, Kaya Okinori was tapping his foot on the ground anxiously. He had to get the call. For what must have been the fourth time in that hour, he checked the lines. They were not cut or bugged. The lines were secure, but no amount of reassurance would convince him so. The room was too dark. He did not like to see his own shadow. It loomed over him. It followed him. It would never leave. He despised it for that. Pulling the cord of the lamp, he read through the papers again. His hands shaking as he pulled them to the light of the lamp. From Nanjing, the camp by Tai, all connected to the end of the war with China. The final moments, you remember those days, how it all seemed so clear? These papers offered a glimpse of those times when peace in all the world was certain. And that grim photo sitting atop the neat stack of papers. The body was unrecognizable, crushed by Chongqing rubble and burned to a cinder. All the evidence was coming back together. In a most terrifying way, it made Kaya Okinari sick to his stomach. The telephone rang. He hesitated for a moment. His heart was beating faster than it had ever rung before, faster than when the bombs hit the Enterprise or when the Germans blew up Pearl Harbor. Suddenly, his gut made the choice for him, and his hands shot for the telephone. The economy is could be better. Well, I have to attempt to get more growth, but I don't want to do text. Temp guy, so it's definitely not as bad, but that would be good as well. No, a great conspiracy. Crap. I don't like this one. I don't know if this is still bugged or not, but we'll see. As Kent Tai reports made their way to Tokyo, it was becoming clear to the Home Minister just how truly the bad, how bad the Chinese infiltration had become. Or reports a little actual basis on the claims of mass infiltration of the Japanese army. They spoke little of Dai Li either, instead presenting a number of theories as to which the Chinese rebels were believed to be so alive and capable of directing such a plot against a co-prosperity sphere. Yet as more and more information arrived at the Home Minister's office, mere rumors and dubious theories began to transform into genuine facts. The name Dai Li began to appear in more and more reports, as it did. So did the names of many Japanese officers. Some were believed to have willingly joined with Dai Li's cause, fully aware of their betrayal. Others were seemingly unaware of their crimes, having been misled by the multitudes of agents that the Chinese had spread throughout the sphere. With each moment, with each paper that was read, with each telegram from Nanjing Kent by time, a conspiracy was being unveiled. As the Home Minister discovered more and more about the seemingly bottomless conspiracy, the circle of those he dared to shake his findings with continued to shrink. He had already begun locking away any document pertaining to Dai Li when he left his office for even a moment. He dismissed his usual assistance too, preferring to copy each file by himself. Another safe, if tedious measure, if for now, he would continue to report to the Prime Minister and only ever in person. If anyone wanted to hear of Dai Li, it would be on Kantai's authority. Oh no. I hope it's not glitched. I hope it's not glitched. I hope it's not glitched at all. Please, please, please. Just build more refiners the War Minister's proposal. The Prime Minister was not exactly sure what he was expecting, and his War Minister did not also seem to know with certainty what exactly he should be expecting. They sat down in the cabinet, and for a few minutes they were completely silent. He could expect anything, outright orders, suggestions of the resignations, very forceful demands of explanations or immediate concessions, and said the War Minister sighed heavily, as he seemed to be struck as heavily by this news as him. I thought I could trust him, you know, he said. I, th I really thought so. The Prime Minister si nodded silently. The general stirred up his tea, not looking at the Prime Minister directly into his eyes. I just wonder how we got here. I don't think it's Dai Li's actually important, he said. What is important is that the army is no longer the paragon of virtue. The men in high ranks working with such war criminals and enemies of the empire? Madness, pure madness, but it's all true. The leader of Japan's civilian government sighed. We should conduct an investigation immediately to find out the traitors and deliver justice, he promised. Yes, I know, the war minister sighed. You know how this works. Those are my conditions. Half an hour later, they were already set in place. The investigation was supposed to be swift, decisive, concluded swiftly, and in limited scale. The army demanded some sort of activity or ability to influence the investigation, although the details will be discussed later. The war minister also asked for the prime minister to inform him regularly of progress. Although conditions were downright insulting for the elected prime minister of Japan, he felt down in his heart that there was not much else choice. We are in no position to deny, of course. Wolofia, huh? Well, we'll see. I want to keep sending them gone, see if they can actually win here. Oh, they lost the division, but the way forward. The arms factory looks so new, as they almost shine underneath the midday sun. A small bundle of co company representatives mailed among themselves at the front of the factory, shaking hands with new employees, making their way to work for the first time. Surrounding them stood a large crowd of suited journalists, asking questions and jotting down notes. As Fukuda Takeo walked out of the, his motorcade, he was instantly assaulted by the very same journalists and company representatives. He barged through them, shaking hands and answering questions until making his way to the podium center at the very center of the facility. Pulling a crowd or speech from his pocket, Fukuda Takeo began to speak to the crowd. No, 
Josh no defense remains as important to his nation as ever was, Fukuda Takeo smiled. Well, maybe not every town, but certainly a lot of them. However, I am of the belief that Japan grew alongside and as a result of its industry and cooperation between all of its citizens. Whether it be the soldiers abroad in China, or sailors living in the Pacific Islands, or our brave factory workers right here in Tokyo. I am proud of this cooperation. I'm proud to stand here addressing you all about the prosperity of our nation. This is the way forward. This is the future. If in the future is bright, picking a chief investigator. Oh, crap. Oh, I have to make decisions now? Oh, no. Once plans for the investigation were brought out of the military, the reaction was predictable. Many forceful letters and telegrams were sent out to the Prime Minister before the two sides came to the negotiating table. Akira Mutos was a long-standing militarist, and his reputation was notorious among the Japanese government for his connections to conspiracies and coups in the interwar years. Now we enter the, the Prime Minister's office, accompanied by half a dozen other army and navy officers to settle the master of the matter of the investigation. You do understand that we will be moving more than willing to supervise the investigation, said Muto bluntly, as finger wrapping on the hardwood chairs he sat in, in across from the Prime Minister. I do understand your reply, but this is a matter of criminal investigation. Many of my associates are suggesting the whole ministry leave the case. To have military supervisors and an investigation over the Imperial Army in China would likely leave many stones on term. General Muto winced, even in his old age. He was prone to bouts of anger, but he cannot risk humiliating himself in front of the Prime Minister. He said once, insisted once again, that leaving the whole ministry in charge would be nothing but a bureaucratic mess, and only had more power to the meddlesome representatives in Tokyo. Your Excellency, the army can acquire the records and, and suspects faster than it'll take the whole ministry. This is an incident outside of Japan, and should fall under our administration, not Tokyo's. It seems that a choice will need to be made as to who, will, who has a full authority on this investigation. More likely than not, someone close is going to be very unhappy. Crap. Uh, paranoia decreases somewhat. The military edge is what we need. I'll be honest. I don't trust either side. I don't trust the army. I don't trust the navy. And I don't trust the camp I tie or the whole ministry too much, but... IJ supports increases somewhat. I don't want more paranoia, but let's take a look here. Where are we at with this stuff? It's at 77. 87. Uh... I don't know. I don't want to trust the army. I really don't. I think we're going to go with the home ministry. Yeah. You know, we're going to boost these guys up too. Uh, where are we at? 72. Yeah, I definitely got to boost these guys up. Lose some army XP. IJ support. A little more paranoid. That's fine. 82. Now they're equal. Welcome aboard. Oh, crap. Action relations. Global complex. Yeah, okay. Not bad. 247 guys still. That's pretty good. The Great Conspiracy Unfolds. So the Camp Aitai officer said to Masahiro, What did you see in the forest? Uh, uh, Lieutenant Masahiro. The HQ would be incredibly interested in the details of such. They sat in the great concrete room with a single electric bulb dangling or lighting the conversation. Masahiro. Masahiro could not hear what was going on outside. The Camp Aitai had requested that he come to their office for questioning. That was the scare of his day. Words that chilled his soul now that he was in the station. He was in the hands of the military police, of course. Well, Masahiro, Masahiro began. The villagers have sighted it or a figure walking through the bamboo forest, wearing a cloak ma made out of long leaves. He rustled his hands against one another. They say that it is a spirit of vengeance, you know, like the Chinese version of Yokai. I do not believe them either. I don't take many walks out there in the woods, but the reports keep coming in. Soon my office was full of villagers, outright gossiping that a spirit of vengeance is coming for us all. The Genpatai officer looked at Masahiro, noting everything he had said. Do you believe it, Masahiro-san? Personally. No, I don't. As I said, I don't take many walks out there in the woods. However, when I do, there's a certain chill that runs through me. He looked down at his fingers like someone was watching me. Hmm, the camp by the officer coughed. That'll be all, thank you. Lieutenant Masahiro, just one question. The officer looked at him intently. How will you go about fighting ghost busting? How will you go about ghost busting? Oh, no. The daily conspiracy. Crap. Oh, God. Organization, army organization regain, war support, daily command power gain. Oh, my gosh. That's not good. Military professionalism, every monthly change. Uh, we're going to lose. We're not going to have any command power now. If the crisis is not wrapped up in a satisfactory manner, there are grave consequences for the whole of Japan. Oh, crap. Hit a menace. Decades ago. Well, we still maintain contact with the now infamously deranged masters of Europe. Our naval attaché spoke highly of the German U-boat. Even our current submarines cannot hope to match the near mythical achievements the Germans were capable of against Allied convoys. We, we can yet return to the drawing board and produce a new class of submarine, one that can match the power of the Germans or at least the Americans in future conflicts. I hope this is not glitched. That, when I did this first time, it was glitched, but... Okay, so... What was once a simple intelligence operation turned out to be one of the largest conspiracies Japan would ever undergo as a nation. Overwhelming even the central government who's unable to determine the sheer scale of the conspiracy, let alone who's involved in it or what its aim is. There are five possible leads one could take to solve the investigation, ranging from incursions deep into China to covert operations in the U.S., and lastly, investigations within our nation itself. Which 
path is chosen or chosen will determine your success investigating the conspiracy. Pick the correct path, and a conspiratorial investigation will go quicker than expected. Pick the wrong path, and you will be setting yourself down a dark path for not only Japan, but the whole conspiracy sphere. <sighs> All right. So if you want to read about these investigating the Chongqing Trail, please go right ahead. As well as Sako, uh, Profile Dai Li, investigate Chinese intelligence services, and Kenpai Tai. I don't like the Kenpai Tai, but I'm going to figure out. Hopefully, which way we can go, but we'll see what happens. Well, everyone, I kind of looked up what we're going to do here, so let's begin with this Dai Li crisis investigation with the Chongqing Trail. So, like I said earlier, before it faded and fade out, if you want to read this, please go right ahead, but let's begin. Where everything started. The Battle of Chongqing ended in 47, and as the last battle of the Second World War, both sides were equally devastated due to starvation and general dissent. Most of the proper army of Chiang Kai-shek collapsed into disorganized militias. One of those militias was infamous, loyal patriotic army led by Dai Li. Despite massive shortages, Dai Li's leadership and fanaticism inspired his men to ferociously resist the Japanese. And the ruins of Chongqing, the supposedly dead body of Dai Li was found, and with LPA units eliminating their activity, it was thought that total victory was fun, or finally won. Now that we know that Dai Li cheated death, we cannot be certain anymore. There are two major questions. Did Dai LPA survived the aftermath of the Chongqing battle, and if so, are they still related to the great conspiracy set by Dai Li? Let's examine the aftermath of the Battle of Chongqing. As we're still watching these guys kill each other off, which is fine. Um, let's see. No evidence, no evidence, no evidence. So we should get some more stuff here. Um, yeah. Remains of the Loyal Patriotic Army. Takechi's, uh, Takamura's office swelters in the humid Sichuan weather, punctuated with a distinct smell of Chung was, and a smattering of both Japanese and Chinese among his clerks. Chengdu was nearing the far ends of Tokyo's grasp over China, and while it may not be an active war zone like Ming Jiang was, it was pretty dead end posting for a career bureaucrat. That is until reports by panic locals started flooding. It started with an upsurge of watchmen weapon acquisitions, sure, a few surplus rifles and sidearms. Well, who cares what goes missing in the labyrinth of Japanese controlled China, anyways? Then, but by bit, the weapon started to disappear, and then the declarations of mourning started. Takamura was called to investigate an attack on the depot far to the north. Reading through the details of the attacks, he felt his blood freeze. This is for Chongqing. There aren't that many organized resistance forces in the region that is capable of such an attack, and the telltale signs were all there. Sure, this can't be it, uttered Takamura. We got rid of the LPA decades ago, or ages ago. Call Sato for a private meeting. I think we may have found something huge here. Focus on core. Um. Uh. Ooh, which one do we want to do? I don't think it really matters which one we do, so. Um. Irrelevant. Focus on Jong Tun into the militia force. Focus on the. We'll see what happens. If, if that goes well for us, great. If not, then it is what it is. We'll get some battleships. And we can talk about justice as well. But let's do the battleship scene first. Mm, thank you. You got new boots, Kane said, chewing at the stripe, strip of jerky. I do indeed, and uh, seven in a clean, a large uniform. You know, it's good to dress in something that actually fits you, Ogawa Tejiro replied. My uniform was all fine. Shirts, pants, tank tops, everything fits very well except for those effing pieces of underwear. I swear my genitals have actually shrunk since during my time here. He groaned and grinned at Ogawa. But I finally have been liberated. My genitals can roam freely once again. Ogawa had to admit, the new boots felt good. He could feel all five toes and he could wriggle them one by one. The socks were not the scratch pieces of fabric he had become so accustomed to, but soft pieces of wool that actually comforted his feet from the boots rather than adding to the misery of Ogawa's crappy boots. Marching practice, Kane groaned. Ogawa could hear the siren too, but perhaps with the new boots it would not be so bad. Come on, let's go. We don't want to keep Officer Hayawa. Hayao, waiting. The march went well, very well, actually. Ogawa led the group of jogging men down the course, smiling all the way. Huh. Each step felt like justice, justice for his poor, abused little toes. When the man sat down for the break, or a break, the food was not pig slop, but carefully prepared pork and rice topped with soy sauce. And all of it came in large portions, and for once it was warm. Break ended with Ogawa leading the marching group again. He joined in with a smile as the men sung their way down the marching course. So Ogawa knew that something would be let up. His expectations were too low to not know that. But for the time being, he was happy. How could he waste such an opportunity? Come on, boys, hurry up! 1.5%? Hey, 106.6%? Not bad. Less than 14 billion in deficit? Not bad. And Harold Wilson? Good job, Harold Wilson. Good job. And anything else here? 247, no. And how's the war going? Uh, armed insurgencies? Oh, you bet we are. The investigation begins. The Sichuan humidity was tempered by a misty morning drizzle as raindrops tapped the window and tight. 
Takechi's Takamura's office was usually a core spy for the liaison's officer turned into an immense distraction to his work for on the investigation. Opposite him was Mara-san Sato, jovially whistling the melody of a Shanghai barroom singer playing on the turntable. Cut it out, Sato, I'm working here. Well, where the heck are you even going to start? There's 20 new groups calling themselves resistance fighters every month, only to reveal themselves as extortion gangs in the second week. That's not what you... Forget it. Just <clears throat> turn down the turntable a little bit and pass me that folder. No worthy groups and organizations. Interesting little folder for backwater like this. The folder was, as Soft had mentioned previously, filled with irrelevant and trifling groups. Heck, there are even six-figure claimings to be directly loyal to Chiang Kai-shek himself, ignoring how he's dead and decidedly for so more than 20 years now. Dekamura's light, a cigarette, and sighs in frustration until Sato breaks his silence. Hey, how come that new monastic order from Hui isn't on this file? Why on earth would you raise suspicions on a monastic order? Because Tsuji shoots darn near anyone who tries to leave. Either they're ridiculously lucky or they're not from Hui in the first place. Like sand in the Sea of Sam. Or the auspicious J. Well, why the heck did I guess that earlier? I told you before, Takamura. No resistance fighter group would actually come out and call themselves resistance fighters. The Order of the Auspicious J was an ordinary monastic organization on the surface. Adherents of Mongolian Buddhism, they claimed to be refugees from Hui State. An organization dedicated to forming mutual aid networks through the Circle of Temples to alleviate the misery as well as savagery brought upon by Tsuji's administration. An open on the surface, it seems. With little reason to suspect. At least one until until one realizes it's not impossible to evade Taiji's cavalry patrols roaming around the borders of Hui to ensure nobody escapes. So what now? Well, we could just wait for them to reveal themselves. I heard from one certain Zhang Liren that they don't even speak Mandarin in the Northwest dialect. One of their leaders even sounds like he's from Yunnan. Takamura knows that they don't have much time, but who can he rely on for a quick and decisive raid? The police? Or the quick rabble who are bathing in a cloud of opium half the time? The campfire by time? Who's to say they're not an ally? The only reasonable option left is the army. He could count on a favor from a certain gambling adult. Gambling adult colonel. Give me the address of the orders HQ. I'll ring Colonel Tamachi. Once he lets his hand off the bottle, let's snoop him out. Well, let's see what happens. The order. Wait. Oh no, this is bugged, is it not? It's bugged. This it just popped up. We literally just read this one. Oh crap. I hope it's just a glitch. A slight slight file glitch. But round up in Chengfu Chengdu successful. Masa, Masaharu Sato stands underneath a street lamp and a seemingly empty road. Taking out a match, he lights up one and wipes it on his boot. He repeats a weird gesture again, twice for posterity. Upon the third match, eight plainclothes agents armed with Arasaka rifles and Nambus emerge from an alley. Almost thought you got forgot the signal. Where is Takamura? Bureaucracy. The nine men walked up to the monastery's compound carefully while stopping behind a corner to avoid his sentry. The sentry made a faithful turn towards the patrols. Sato locked him in a chokehold with a knife to his throat. I know who you are, and I know what you do. If you cooperate, I'll let you live. So answer the question, good, as he order a Zhong Tong unit. Sentry nods, gulping nervously. Good man, two of you, keep them tied here. Attacking detachments split themselves into two units, one from the main entrance, and the rest from one from a side gate left unchecked or unlocked by the sentry. The ensuing firefight was a one-sided slaughter, with only one Japanese operative dead. As Sato approached the corpse of the order's leader, he stumbled upon several dossiers left in an unlocked safe. Operation Auspicious Jade. Chengdu infiltra Infiltration Contingency. At the foot of the folder lies a seat, a personal seal, I mean. Of Dai Li, as well as Jung Tong seal of approval. So also left out a grim. His work here is done. Hey, got some yellow evidence. Regarding evidence. So now we're gonna choose the same thing again. And do the exact same thing again. We'll go down the other way. Come on, Cameroon, don't lose, don't lose. You better not lose. We've invested way too much in you. Oh god. Uh We clicked it once. I don't want to click it again. Okay, the remains of the Low Patriotic Army. There we go. If you want to read this again, please go ahead. We did last time in Zhong Tung Corps, so let's launch an investigation into Dai Li's militia force. Let's see what happens this time. I hope it counts when we actually get this, but we'll see. We will hide. We do here. You know what? We'll give him stuff too. Screw it. You're gonna have I'm not sure they're gonna have to use it, but unauthorized go slow motion or action. Oh, again. This is stupid. Uh, God dang it. Ah. Cameroon, you better not lose, son. Actually, water off a duck's back. Ooh. Recent news came in from the continent that Fuhrer Martin Bowman has reevaluated the botched and flimsy racial hierarchies promoted by his predecessors that and removed the Yamato peoples of their honorary Aryan status in German medical science. Scuffed as a political move, the Japanese public's attitude towards the revocation has been lighthearted at best, and as very few across the empire genuinely believe the nonsense espoused by the quack scientists making excuses for the European barbarism. 
Members of the cabinet spoke to the press in the following days, and the general consensus seems to be careless and total indifference towards the German announcement. Von Minister himself commented that the inconsistent and interchangeable racial theories of the German heralds is testament to the fickle temper and naive understanding of the world, a far cry from Germania's violent rhetoric in recent weeks. Although the news has come in a series of striking diplomatic measures to apply pressure to the core prosperity sphere, fear of Bormann's state of purpose is in this act is a strike of fear into the hearts of the Japanese, then he has abjectly failed. I'm not sure, but you can't scare us. Mm, not sure what else would be here. Anti air. Cameroon. The LPA corner. This can't be real. You think we finally struck something? I'm sure of it. Northern Chengdu has been a red blip on the army since two weeks ago. Quietly under Takamura as he let out another pop from his half spin cigarette. It seems as though he's finally tracked down the ever elusive loyal patriotic army, or at least whatever's left of it. Though this was a shot in the dark, it was the only shot the department had at this moment, and time is ticking away before they can yet again bleed into the countryside. Maybe we can finally get this daily crap moving. Maybe so, Sato san, maybe so. Takamura and Sato quickly realize that their overstretched police squadrons probably wouldn't be picked up for a task or a job like this, and unfortunately, there's only one more authority in the region they can trust to expand this mission with the army. The pent up paranoia from the inter service rivalry, partisan and partisan attacks, understandably made Takamura incredibly reluctant to cooperate with the army, let alone on such a high risk mission like this. Unfortunately, only the army has the resources for such an excursion to both conduct the sweep and gather sensitive intelligence from the countryside. Ring that old uh, dog, Fuji Fujimaro, right now, and tell him Takamura wants a meeting in the confidence as soon as he get, lets go of that bottle, and don't, don't bring the Kenpai Tai into this, not yet, at least. Takamura knows he has to act, and he has to act fast. Now his entire premise hinges on whether the army is willing to cooperate in the sweep. It's the oddest things of bringing the strangest bedfellows together, military industrial complex, unfortunately, though. A coupling of our military and industry is what made us great in the past, it is also what will bring us greatness in the future. There's no need to break up the arrangement between the armed forces and industrial powers, rather, it should be integrated further so that innovative technologies can be developed and in greater quantities than ever before. If all goes smoothly, cutting edge weaponry will move from the design board to the front line in the blink of an eye, but happy September, my friends, as we do have a sip of coffee to keep us nice and jovial. A red herring, you know. I don't ca I don't get why we're chasing Dai Li even, Takamura. I'm not even sure the man is still alive. The room fills with cigarettes smoke, par for the course of overwork liaison officers in the tropical hectic that is stage one. Uh a thin, measly light bulb shines around the room, leaving faint shadows. Faint shadows exactly like the ones Sato and Takamura were chasing. I don't either, but the evidence is here. There, I'm sure of it. We just have to. F Takamura's interrupted by courier. He heaving to catch his breath, the courier manages to give the officer a salute before handing a folder to Sato. On the cover lay the words, after action report, Sato peeled to the next page, eager in anticipation. What well, Guido made his heart sink. Hey, Takamura, you, you may want to see this. Fearing the worst, Takamura snatches a folder from Sato's hands. His heart sinks to his stomach too when he reads the contents, followed by a deep sigh. Juntong Unit Cotton Raid, not affiliated to Dai Li. Any organization's connections to Dai Li is fragile, if existent. Command a suggestion, terminate investigation. Dai Li eludes us once again. Oh, we got that one done. And actually, before we keep going on, how many divisions do these guys have? They have a lot of manpower. They actually have less manpower. They have one more production unit. Seven divisions. Ooh, that's not good. Oh, that is not good. Yeah, I might do some funky stuff here, because I'm not going to lose that. We've invested way too much for this campaign for them to not do great here. Mm. So after doing the Chongqing Trail twice, investigate Sako, we'll do it once, and the fate of the American Expeditionary Forces. A Sino-American cooperative organization, the American Expeditionary Force that was deployed during the second WW, was expected to believe been fully evacuated by 44. With far more pressing matters to take care of, the traces left by the Sako were quickly investigated and mostly forgotten. They became little more than a memory from the war that left a little behind and no to concern to Japan, or so it believed. With the link between the Americans and Dai Li having recently been uncovered, the remains of the Sako's presence that littered China became a priority for the investigators. A number of planes were wrecked in close proximity to each other. A sign might prove vital to finding out what truly happened to the Americans. At the same time, the security ministers contacted spies in the U.S. Should they be capable of finding files on the fate of the expeditionary forces, it is expected that records of who among the Americans returned alive are so kept, and that they are within our reach. As the behest of the Home Minister, it was decided that the investigating officers be given the reins to choose which route to pursue first. Theories raced to the heads of the investigators as they considered their options. Had Dai Li escaped the war through with the evacuating Americans, only to return a few months ago? Has Sako helped to establish Dai Li's presence in China over 20 years ago? Could it be that the U.S. were funding Dai Li, using the evacuation of 44 as a cover for the forces, secretly remaining in the region? The truth, the only truth, that the investigators could count on so far was that only by digging deeper would they uncover what they sought. Did all Americans really abandon China? Nice. And I may right now, quite literally, may or may not, oh, more deficit, be looking at a guide right now on my phone. But Sako's background. Oh, the investigation begins. Wait, what? Uh, 
And a glance. Uh, I read this earlier, like sand in a sea of sand. I read that one. Oh, no, 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 no. We don't want this one to fire yet. Oh, we have to do it. Oh, God, no. We'll do this in a very specific order. If things happen, I'm just going to fire the event at the end. So, uh, this, this is still a bug. That's disappointing. Let's talk about background. The Sino American Cooperative Organization, the American Expeditionary Force, uh, was deployed during the war. It was believed to have fully evacuated by 44. Uh, I think I just read this one. Yeah, I just read this one. Well, let's see. We should do... Investigate Sako. Alert contacts in the U.S. Alert the American detachments. I'm not clicking on that one. That might glitch us out here, so... We have evidence. We have evidence as well regarding the Chinese involvement in the investigation. Admiral Miles' whereabouts, huh? You can have myself. Getting access to the archives. Naturally, anything pertaining to covert military operations in a hostile foreign power will be closely guarded behind safes, locks, and guarded doors. The first step to access the records was fairly, fairly simple. The archive building would be scouted out day and night. Each entrance would be checked for alarms, guard patrols, and it would be memorized in any potential job or opportunity that might get one. And so the building would be quickly taken. More and more info was gathered during the uh, regarding the archives. Photographs were taken of the exterior and surrounding area at every hour of the day. Eventually, blueprints of the building were uncovered and discovered, providing the spies with a new level of insight. A plan would begin to take shape. The next step would involve getting inside the archives for long enough to expand upon the limited insider knowledge. The fastest possible route from one entrance to the Sako riot files would be plotted and impossible tested before the actual breaking would take place. These next few steps would be delicately executed, even with with pressure from the government back in Japan. Some in Tokyo demanded a quicker operation, yet this course of action was ruled out. It was better to not start a diplomatic incident with the U.S., whilst at the same time dealing with a possible conspiracy within the ranks of the army. Just a little more time. Peace has been brought to Vietnam. Fresh air at last. Well, good job for you guys, I guess. Come on, Cameroon. Don't lose it. Oh, mmm. Don't lose it. Ah, record's found. In the end, it took merely one person, one open door, and a faulty electrical system to gain access to the soccer files. For the janitor on duty, I've been careless enough to leave the back entrance way unlocked after finishing up for the night. Five minutes later, the power went out, and the security guard called for an electrician to resolve the issue. For the brief 15 minutes, the building was completely dark, and security a little lax as the guard himself escorted the electrician to the fuse box. That Yet, that was all it took at the time. A man in a black coat entered the building and removed exactly one document from the Chinese section of the archives, before leaving and driving off in a rather anonymous van. He would later meet with the janitor and the electrician to celebrate the successful operation. The cargo of the van was handed off to yet to another agent, waiting at a nearby airfield. After a number of plane and car journeys from the east coast to the west and a brief stop in San Fran, he boarded a boat headed to Hawaii. Waiting there was General Fujiwara himself, who had be, be, been anxious to see the documents and delivered. Now they were in his hands, safe on his personal plane en route to Tokyo. It was there that the files were finally opened. Behind closed doors, Fujiwara and the Prime Minister, alongside other trusted officials, gathered to hear just what the Americans knew. It was a simple enough thing, a mere list of the facts of the Sako members listed alphabetically. Beginning with those killed, one name with interest cropped up, General Joseph Stilwell, confirmed to have been KIA. The assembled politicians continued to scan the list with a growing sense of angst and urgency, just as it seemed that they were about to hit another dead end consisting of nothing but returned. More and more Americans were listed as MIA, possibly being forced to stay behind, yet one name made the officials pause in the tracks, the name of a rumored friend of Dai Li. Miles Milton E. Admiral, MIA, last seen three days prior to the, the full Sacco evacuation. Admiral Miles never left China. Oh boy, so that should end that one, so we can click on that one too. Um, let's get through this other event. <sighs> Why does it fire? Man, I... now I need to investigate China's intelligence next. Hidden Menace, yeah. And we, of course we do this one next as well, so. The Order of the Auspicious Jade, if you want to read that again, please go ahead. Adjust to see of leads. We're wasting time. If you want to read this one, this is just the failure one, so that's not our fault. But next, what we're going to do, because we just did investigate Sako, we need to investigate the Chinese Intelligence Service. The Chinese army, while small, was to be trusted. The Republic of China administration was also trusted as the great reforms of Gao Zongwu were seen as beneficial to the host sphere, not anymore. With the revelations of Dali being alive, all cases were open once again. Corruption. <clears throat> So easily ignored early now became the threat of national security. The party's bizarre relationships, none of that was being to be ignored anymore. Post-1947, the Republic of China administration was purged out of, out of agents, or at least it was believed so. Now with the unholy revelations being unleashed, those events should ring the alarm now would. Of course, the Republic of China's administration is loyal to us, but lone wolves can work in a structure nonetheless. It is therefore very important to immediately conduct full-scale investigations into both civilian administration of the Nanjing government and intelligence service of Jess Field 76, who achieved Ding Mokan, while Loa proved to be rather incompetent. Unfortunately, while this objective has to be done, we have to rely on China's cooperation with us and that they'll not slow down the investigation. We'll do it live. The Jiantung was decentralized. 
The first groups of agents waiting in the room were from two very separate worlds. To the left sat a number of Chinese intelligence officials working to catch down the last traitors of China's new regime. To the right, the heart of the Japan's investigative committee on a mission to find a once dead terrorist now influencing all of China to revolt. <clears throat> The Japanese investigators were hesitant of the Chinese comrades' findings, but may remain eager to see the final results of the audit. The head of the joint sound of Japanese group entered, holding a pile of papers, a summation of their work in tracking down the Juntong. He distributed open, distributed copies across the table, and the room was silent, but for the flipping of paper and breathing. Auditing revealed, in, revealed that the Juntong, Daily's profit intelligence agency, is not is likely not in the direct command structure. Rather, it appears that the Juntong has become decentralized, as small cells dot all of China with a little cross-communication. A single hunt might bring in just half a dozen agents with no direct superiors. It seems that we will need to find out how exactly these cells coordinate their findings. If the Himmler of China is to be called and defeated, any intercepted message must be analyzed thoroughly from now on. But how can he do with so much surveillance? <clears throat> we'll see what happens. With what? You better not lose, Cameroon. For the love of God, you better not lose. Oh, we're lagging super hard here, too. Or maybe not. Jun Tong Internal Communications Breakthrough. The branch of the investigative committee in Nanjing have been working fiercely after the sabotage by the Chinese agents who had lied about the structure of Daili's resistance organization, including the Jun Tong, Daili's spy network, which made Japan's war on China even a more brutal affair. After removing the Chinese investigators, they had been able to determine a number of Jun Tong cells operating in China. And among their leaders was Milton Miles, an American admiral who confirmed to be alive in China, no doubt helping the Juntong Howry Cub. Investigator Tadano Nishi, one discussion with his fellow agents, laid out a brief, brilliant theory as Admiral Miles' current situation. But since Dai Li and Admiral Miles are still alive, he began, there is no doubt that these two men are working together. However, we have not received many letters confirming this connection. But that doesn't mean they're working together. They aren't working together. What if the two are purposeful in sending out such outdated and minute information? I've been pouring through the letters available, and I've noticed a few interesting patterns symbols or pattern symbols. I've noticed only 12 of these symbols ever being used. It has to be the Chinese calendar Nishi suggested, and the others nodded along in agreement. It's a long chance, but I think it might work, and if it does, each day, each and every one of us will be written in the records of history as a code breaker to save the Empire. For days, the encryption strategy of the Chinese calendar yielded nothing but swaths of hidden information, more than they had acquired in months. Nishi, a young and inspiring officer, may have just opened the door to ending this titanic conspiracy. It's clearer than ever that if Milton Miles was alive, he was operating in a Shanghai cell. Kamp Tai were immediately sent to the streets of the city, and the youthful investigator earned himself commendation from the highest members of the investigation. Finally, cheers for Tadano Shunji. But, round up. Oh, what? Ah, uh, I hate how glitched this is, man. Origin of the Juntong Executive Orders. Reports returned to to us came with an upbeat attitude, as the Kenpai Tai made a number of breakthroughs over the past few days regarding a series of high-profile letters, almost certainly from Juntong cells. Their origins stemmed from a number of locations in China, some from large cities, while others fell into investigators' hands from far-flung villages and outposts. And each one contained a mess of jargon that still needed to be decoded, but the letters were all sent to a specific neighborhood, deep in the heart of Shanghai. According to members of the investigation of the Kenpai Tai, the underbelly of Shanghai would serve as a likely hideout for Dai Li, and other conspirators to vanish him. The sprawling harbor districts were notorious for hosting many illicit figures, and a vagabond rubble like Dai Li could hide among the triumph. The policeman would question if he came out with his knees intact and a small stack of bills. While well, the suspect's range shrunk to the limits of the city, we can probably catch the two before they get when and flee from Shanghai. No gangster rubble can throw off the trail now. The corner rats have nowhere to run. We got red intelligence, and we gotta wait so we can get some more intelligence soon, too. We'll see what happens. Of course, counter espionage efforts. Reports have come in from code breakers that they are overwhelmed with documents. Camp Ate agents have recovered truly massive amounts of papers or letters and orders from the Juntong in recent weeks, with caches of paper trail coming in by the truckload of clandestine offices. Even with the most powerful commuting systems running day and night, members of our technical and decryption department have complained that simply cannot keep up. The best code breaking machines in our arsenal seem to have no pattern. To find no pattern in the piles of messages de de delivered daily, it isn't impossible any partisan could create an unbreakable code without help. Some are pointing the finger at Admiral Miles, who probably gets codes created by the American computers across the Pacific, and gives them to Dai Li and any other Juntong groups in China. There could even be the possibility that there is internal sabotage, but it is more than likely that these uncrackable codes are more than what Dai Li would create, could create, even at his side of power. Keep them at him. Dai Li's secrets must be found no matter the cost. Now we're at 30 here, huh? No? There's nothing up here. They're fucking hard and deep. That's pretty concerning for us. 300 billion in debt. Oh my goodness. Can't fight that trail. Ah, there we go. Uh, 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 can we read the top? The room was isolated as it could be, deep in the labyrinth of the government facilities underneath Tokyo's intelligence HQ, guarded by secret agents, security agents unmatched in skill. 
and buried beneath nearly 30 meters of asphalt, concrete, and steel, two men sat in a bare room. Mr. Izuzu, I hope you understand the utmost seriousness of a report of treason in this investigation, the investigator said, eerily calm underneath the humming incandescent bulb. If your claim is even the slightest bit incorrect, you will be terminated from this investigation at the least. Mr. Izuzu's eyes. <clears throat> Tutter frantically across the room. In a theater, yes, but who else would believe it? It would bring the whole investigation crashing down, perhaps even the country. It made no sense, but he felt it to be the case. Investigate uh, Kawashima. I work for the decryption department. We've been seeing nothing but failure in our efforts. Every day at the camp I try to deliver us piles upon piles of acquired documents from raids, but there is no pattern. He cleared his throat before continuing. These papers are not code. They are completely random characters and words thrown together. The investigator took a cigarette out from his pocket. Isn't it your job to separate this randomness? I do understand the delays in code breaking, and I can tell you that there are people far more powerful than either of us who want it done now. Hey, investigator, I am telling you, look at this. Mr. Izu opened a folder of documents, labeled as unimportant. There is no pattern. We have checked this against Juntong codes, German, American, and even old Russian ones. I can't buy tire giving us pointless documents that are not unsolvable, but not even meant to be solved. Dai Li could just be <clears throat> in a moment of defiance. <clears throat> Perhaps Mr. Izu's most daring action of his life. He cut off Ka Ka Kawashima. I can't buy tire sending these, Investigator. I cannot see any other answer. I swear to you it is true. Investigator Kawashima. He grew more frantic with each sentence, slamming his fist down on the mental table. They're giving us nothing, nothing you can ask anyone. I swear. All the while, Mr. Kawashima looked on in cold anger. I can't buy tire hiding something. I can feel it. Please look into it. Do it for yourself. Do it for our empire. They're not telling us everything. When Mr. Izu collapsed into a seat, his voice hoarse. Mr. Kawashima looked at him with a mix of shock and fury. He felt his blood seethe as his lone technician raved about the Kenpai Tai. It couldn't be true. He was a madman, driven to lunacy. In order to justify his lack of progress, he stood up and left the room, gathering Mr. Izu's files with him. Before he closed the heavy door, he remarked with a final thought beginning to nod his mind that maybe this seemingly crazed man had an inkling of truth to his theory. You are dismissed, Izuzu-san. Now we must go ahead and investigate Sako. Again. So you're going to do that again, please go ahead. Did the Americans really abandon China? Yoru Baland, huh? Come on, Cameroon. Don't lose it. Don't lose it. We invested way too much into you. And you know what? We can investigate crash heads, but we're going to reload American detachments once again. Because <clears throat> we're looking to get the green code, as well as the brown code as well. Cool. Just because I want to make sure we do this correctly. I want to do it right. Getting access to the archives. If you want to read about this one again, please go right ahead. I love to do this one, but we, we literally could not defend here, so I don't understand how it's supposed to happen, but whatever. There are ground vehicles. You can have some more stuff. That's fine. We have enough PP for now, anyways. Sucko rocket is found. Oh. We've gained evidence again, of course. The purple one. Um, Sassinator Spear. Maybe I, that was not right to do. Because we need the green one still, but still. Searching for a dead man. Here we go. The revelation. <clears throat> Uh, oh, God, what is it? There it is. Uh, the Sako documents began to take its grasp over the assembled politicians, leaving them perplexed no, momentarily. A degree of normalcy had then returned to the room. Before the PM dismissed his raid advisors, just prior to exiting himself, the Home Minister announced that he would be contacting Kanpai departments across the sphere in the hopes that they might not be able to finally narrow down the search. With the investigators now out in the field again, they were able to make some heavy headway regarding the missing admiral. A courier sent out of Shanghai was found to be carrying a package discreetly marked with the emblem of the Juntong, the intelligence service belonging to the Dai Li. Interrogating the courier revealed that he had been paid a hefty sum to take the package from Shanghai to Hangzhou, where he would again be paid upon delivering the parcel to a location, just outside the city. The man in question was certainly not the admiral based upon the courier's description, yet it was a solid lead nonetheless. Before proceeding any further with the mission, the agents delivered the report to the home minister, detailing the investigator's new hypothesis regarding the admiral's uh, current actions and whereabouts. While they were yet to confirm the exact location, the most obvious spot was now Shanghai, a large coastal city with a great deal of foreigners made for a good hideout for an American not looking for attention. Juno Fujiwara sent the investigators a simple request or response upon reading the report. Move in on Shanghai, you will receive information and reinforcements soon. Surround the city and find Admiral Miles. One step closer, my friends. Can we find the Admiral? We have, we have, we have, we have, have. We have not gathered enough evidence for orange. Oh, that's actually, that's glitched. So if you don't know, um, the orange one is glitched here, so it won't even fire in game, which is stupid. So, uh, I thought this was supposed to be fixed, but whatever. The Admiral's cover. 
Shanghai was filled with agents of the Kenpai Tai and Toko, from each and every direction. Some took up positions along the road and in and out of the city, while others used disguises in order to infiltrate the recesses of the Shanghai's underbelly. They would slowly sink their claws into the city, sealing off each and every escape route with every passing day. If nothing else, the Admiral would be quite unable to leave without being seen, and an invisible siege had just begun. While the investigation agents continued to widen their net over Shanghai, they turned their focus towards what identify a Milton E. Miles might have assumed to blend into the new surroundings. As an American, the Admiral would already be limited in his options. He would need to remain in the district's home to many foreigners, with a financial district coming to the minds of the investigators first. Miles was likely posing as a merchant, someone recognizable to his allies, but still enough to avoid suspicion. <clears throat> then there was the issue whether the Admiral was still in communications with the U.S. There were undoubtedly other Americans working covertly in Shanghai, most of which would be working for the CIA in some direct or indirect capacity, yet. Yeah. It was still too early to determine whether Miles would be among this group of countrymen. It was a major threat to the Japan, and first and foremost, regardless of who he counted among his allies, with that. Another round of theorizing was completed by the investigators, as they sat around a dingy bar on the outskirts of Shanghai proper. It was now time to enter the Admiral's hiding grounds and root him out by whatever means necessary. Contact Shanghai now. Yeah, that's... that's I was... I thought it was in the patch notes. For toolbox here that they fix this, but apparently not. Across the bridge of light. Two sounds permeated the hospital. The first was a consistent and gentle hum of the ceiling fan which produced an almost sporific, soporific aura in the space that the fan overlooked. The second sound was that of coughing, vicious and painful coughing that would have made one think the man unfortunate to be producing the sound was having his lungs torn apart. The patient had come a long way from his comfortable rural childhood across the seas. Yet here he was in Shanghai, and an Australian merchant who had sold rare herbs from the Chinese countryside to rich Westerners for over 20 years, much had been achieved both above and below and under the table. But he would never be able to return to his home at this point. No matter how hard he tried, he was simply too sick at this point, and hooking him from the machines in the hospital would let, him, let the cancer take over. Could he have done more towards his ultimate goals? Could he have been a better ally to his friend? He thought in a shame that he might not have lived long enough to witness the fall of the sphere. At least he would have had hastened its demise, perhaps more than he anticipated. The former trader turned weary turned his weary head towards the window. The sun was beginning to set, casting a bright orange glow over Shanghai. The trader seemed to breathe easier. Eventually, the gentle hum of the fan above him lulled him into a sleep from which he did not wake. Although somewhat well known, the trader remained somewhat of a mystery to his peers. He never did a will, and had seemingly no friends or family to mourn him. However, there was a small note that he had scribbled one request upon for those who would be tasked with burying him. It was a simple enough thing to ask, to be buried in his own uniform. It had been kept in a box near his deathbed, folded with great care and respect. As it was taken out of its container, the nurse couldn't help but notice the golden name plate fastened upon the breast pocket. Admiral Milton E. Miles. Requiescat in pace. Internal disruptions to our investigations are grave. After securing the city, they had moved on to the financial district, hoping to locate the Admiral before he could react to their presence. Many Shanghainese had indeed heard of a Western trader either from Australia or possibly the U.S. He in fact arrived some decades ago and quickly been blended in with among the traditional style shops and stalls of the district outskirts. He seemingly disappeared only a few years ago, having closed up his shop and said his last goodbyes to his business associates. At the very least, they were now able to locate the traders or the supposed trader shop. The new owners had met their predecessor only very briefly. Some weeks later, he had been buried upon a hill outside the city. It was simple, almost unremarked grave, hidden among many others of its kind, a simple if elegantly crafted cross marked the spot. The name upon it was false, that of some persona that Admiral Milton E. Miles had created for himself. He apparently died in the December of 61, something that concerned the investigators greatly. The next step was crude enough, but necessary. The dead man was dug up and found to be wearing Admiral Miles' uniform. Hospital records confirmed that he had been, indeed been dying of cancer, and the doctors were just about to recognize his photograph, even without the beard he had grown during his time in Shanghai. He finally reached the trail's end. They had finally reached it. The last few interrogations little more than enough to lead them back to that same grave where the trail would go icy over and over again. The dead man could only be Admiral Isles. Miles. There was nothing else to suggest he had faked his own death and nothing to suggest that the Sako files had been deliberately made inaccurate. The trail had ended. Fujiwara was left puzzled by the revelation. It provided a sense of finality yet raised new concerns most of all. It cast a shadow of doubt over the entire conspiracy now that one of his key figures had in fact been dead for some time now. Progress had been made, but was now certainly not the time to rest easy. We are casting shadows. Uh... Technically, we should be able to do this one, but we don't have the orange one yet, so... It seems like we could try it. And if it goes poorly, then it's not great. But we could try it regardless. Let's at least try it. Because technically, we did get it, so create a profile of Dai Li. And if we have all the clues, though. Because um, we had the orange one earlier, right? We have all the clues. We should be able to do this one. For thousands of Japanese troops, the names of the mysterious individual responsible for the suffering and death was not known. Many Chinese patriots died of assassins employed by him, not realizing the mastermind behind him. Uh, after the northern expedition the to the Japanese, Dai Li was just one of almost anonymous officials. The true nature of the monster was revealed only later. Thousands dead, loyal allies gone, and every carefully planned offensive hit by the leaks, all possible thanks to the spy master of the cursed Chiang Kai-shek. 
In the aftermath of the Battle of Chongqing, the infamous Himmler of the China was believed to be dead. Now when he is revealed, many questions of old return to the more tremendous force. Who is this man? What does he believe? What are his goals? Who are the people that follow him? Questions pop and they must be answered. I don't know why this is still glitched, man. It's, it's, it's aggravating. How did she death? The investigators were stupefied at the task ahead of them. Dai Li was alive and planning resistance in China. And the only reason anyone was aware of this was a policeman who noticed that the charred corpse was too short. Who knows what other information must have been passed over. The most powerful men in Japan wanted answers now, and so the vetted agents went to work. Day and night, investigators poured through every footnote they had on his organization during 1944. There were at least 100,000 other Juntong agents throughout China, probably twice as many military political men who could have followed the man out of Chongqing, a network. Of that, many people would need to be whittled down if any evidence was to lead to more of a hunt than a senile X5. Decrypted lists from the war detailed hundreds of NRA cells and caches. Fortunately for the archivists, there was plenty of records from the IJA of which holdouts had been found and eliminated. After days of searching, it became clear that Dai Li had plenty of ways to get out of Chongqing and with other anti-Japanese leaders declared missing. A truly cunning and worthy opponent, indeed. His hideout. The map of China laid before the investigators was real with hastily drawn slashes and circles. More detailed maps of nearby provinces were filled with the same markings, mar parts of them, sticking up from the main map before them. The villages where high level Zhongtong agents live, suspected locations of rural China, even the great cities of. The ghosts were probable areas for Dai Li to remain unseen, but their superior had come in with excellent news. It's impossible that the Americans would still be supplying Dai Li, a chief investigator bristled to his staff. There's no way that there could be any amount of supplies transferred without our knowledge, to fuel any sort of unrest. No, Dai Li is gathering strength without the Americans, but he still has other conspirators in its ranks. <clears throat> The investigators listened intently as their lieutenant briefed them on new revelations. A separate task force had been found connections to Admiral Miles, a U.S. naval officer and well-known friend of Dai Li in Shanghai. It can be safely assumed, but he said that China's most wanted man could be hiding in or around the port city. A Shanghai correlation, a correlation and narrows down our investigation, at least. There he comes. Find APCs, casts. His transport helicopters. His motive? For all the research and investigations the committees had done, there was one question that had to be put to the side for more pressing matters of finding Dai Li. What was his plan? Why was he still fighting for a war decades pa gone past? The committee vetted much of Japan's top criminal psychologists to help piece together the mind of a terrorist. The investigators were clear, though, that even the slightest mention of the existence of the Japanese public would be met with the utmost repercussions on the entire careers at best. Around a conference table, and one of the many buildings the investigators occupied, a dozen or so men and women who made up Japan's greatest psychologists could only come to a few conclusions. Some said Dai Li was simply driven insane by the war. Others suspected he could be planning on an attempt to sabotage the army, or even overthrow the Chinese government. Other psychologists suggested countless other motives, though these were reasons for a thug to rob at home, uh, not the driving force for a national conspiracy. After some more hours of debate, the conclusive statement is that a currently unknown motive, and insane or vengeful as any fanatical holdout may be. China is not susceptible to any sort of uprising to turn against them, turn them against the Japanese Empire. The investigators sigh in frustration. Dai Li's master plan cannot be predicted. Worrisome of quite indeed. A meeting of elites. The halls of power were never truly safe from businessmen. Even a prime minister had to grovel from town to time to give out concessions in return for some favor, but Kaya Okanari smiled. The businessmen were men means to an end. Let them think that they even had a sliver of influence over the government, and they would go wild defending it. Effing leeches, Kaya thought. The Strategic Industry Development Act will be the most profitable piece of government legislation in the history of this nation, Kaya said to the room of assembled industry and company leaders. The contracts that would be handed out are massive and include extremely generous payouts for the companies that apply for them. Military procurement is an extremely important factor in keeping the armed forces afloat and makes it an extremely important affair for me. The businessman made a little noise, but Kaya could still tell they were already invested. They, they had a taste of the prosperity Kaya's government had produced for arms manufacturers in the country. Now they wanted the whole bowl to themselves. Unless I'm not quite sure if I can manage to float this piece of legislation through the government. I have the, the influence of, to my own faction. But that alone may not be enough. To ensure the quality of the armed forces we currently possess, I implore you all to make the right decisions in helping me push this act through the government. Hook, line, and sinker. Uh, ooh, our soldiers control the ground. That's not bad. I like that one a lot, actually. Our ships rule the waves? This one first. The modernization of the Imperial Japanese Army is complete. The shield and sword of the co prosperity sphere rule unimpeded throughout East Asia, inspiring jubilation in our allies, respect in our vassals, and doubt in our enemies. Let us show the demagogues in the Reich and the fools in the states the power of our armaments, followed up with our ships rule all the waves. Our navy is a powerful tool. Refurbished and thoroughly modernized akin to our land based counterpart, it now serves as a most the powerful right arm of the Japanese nation in the co prosperity sphere. Our admirals commend us on its might, and are convinced that with these vessels they could best the United States Navy in, one -on -one, in a one on one fight. If only the Yamamoto could see what it has become of the Japanese Navy. Well, keep giving them stuff. We still have 247, though. That's not bad. 
So with this one, public approval decreases by 5%, which we're at 44% or so. But, uh, research bonus for industry increases the minimal investment in administrative funding. Nice. Um, more GDP. Not much more, but a little bit more. And Oath and Ash Garden. The skies were choked up by smoke and rubble no matter how far away they were from the carnage. In a hill close by the city, the three men could do little but observe in silent horror. As a metropolis of millions was pillaged no differently than in the Mongol Mongols would have centuries before. Little temples and forts were shattered, and the hush, lush parks and gardens had been burnt to cinders. It did not feel like an active man, but the wrath of a higher power. Lieutenant Governor, or Lieutenant General, Dai Li, oh, turned to his two comrades before breaking the silence they kept since they arrived. To his right stood Li Kanong. A long-time opponent since the Generalissimo began to purge a communist from his clique, now one of the only men he could trust. Aside from one of them was an American, Admiral Miles, silently mouthing a prayer at the sight of the unimaginable devastation. Dali thought back to the millennia-old tales of the Three Kingdoms, of three nobles and cunning leaders meeting to become blood brothers. Yet great princes with honor would have had no answer for a foe which could bring death on land, air, and sea. The peach garden was reduced to ash. And as Chongqing burned, the three men made an oath that this would not be the end. Japan would answer for what they did in Chongqing and dozens of other cities. We will fight, Dai Li said. We will never give up, the, give up this burden until Japan burns like this garden. With that, the three men descended from the hillside, bound together as the leaders of a war that would not end until Japan was brought down and vanquished. Uh... His messengers. The investigator delivered the findings as fast as they were coming in from the field agents. Cheng De based in investigators had closed in on the Shanghai area. Even when having to cover for one of China's most populated regions, it was progress. Recently, a man has been brought into questioning. A former Zhongtong agent had been identified. Now, for now, he continues to have no idea of Dai Li's current plans, but he was able to reveal the complex message system. The chief of intelligence used to gather and send information. Dai Li's immense network of message relays, and agents was open to the investigators. It would be a mess to go through, but it was a solid lead. More and more Camp Ate agents and investigators were assigned to Zhangzhou, Zhangzhou and Xinjiang province by the day, giving constant updates on breakthroughs in unraveling the Zhongtong structure. The mood in offices became one of triumph, not of stress or frustration. The Himmler China and his dangerous associates had nowhere to hide. We're closer to understanding Zhongtong operations than ever before. Oh, expand military research facilities? That's not bad. I like this one a lot, but... Uh, oh, that'd be so good. Better research facilities and industrial equipment. I'm not touching the hardliners. I'm, this is a hard, no hardliner run. Creeping doubts. Investigations in Shanghai only led to dead ends, quite literally. And a plain small graveyard in the city, Camp Ate agents found their man, Miles, uh, Milton Miles, Rear Admiral. Well, the Greystone obviously did not say his name. It was quick for investigators to piece together that the English-speaking smuggler who had been ignored by Shanghai police died in his early 60s was one of the dangerous lapdogs of Dai Li and his master plan. The body had to be checked to fully authenticate their discovery. It was already agreed upon by everyone present that it was Admiral Miles. The man's been dead for almost ten darn years, an investigator snarled over the phone. We have investigators and local police closing off the graveyard to do more analysis, but this is a man dead for ten years. On the other end of the line, his co-worker in a Tokyo office attempted to calm him down, but refused. Tell me why the heck one of our... Uh -oh. Three biggest suspects turn out to be dead. The army finally realized that Ai Li isn't dead, and now we find out Miles is. Doesn't it doesn't seem this is. Uh, doesn't this seem a. Uh, the phone hung up. Cursing, the investigator went back down the streets of the graveyard. The Shanghai cops might not have cared when he was alive, but they were doing a better job keeping the people away once they act shat superiors. But how on earth is a supposed dead man alive and a supposed live man dead? Something doesn't add up. Something does not add up at all. At all. I drift to see leads. Oh, are you kidding me? So with that one, um, I'm gonna go off screen and I'm just gonna fire the event anyways, just because uh, this is still glitched. Crud. Proof and its consequences. Prime Minister, the Dai Li situation is taking a severe turn. I believe it is best to meet with you to discuss the matters at once. The whole minister put down the receiver and prepared to deliver the news to the Prime Minister. He'd been expecting an awful conspiracy to be uncovered, that the military was utterly compromised and posed to strike at the government. Yet now, that he knew the truth, that he had been leading this entire ministry on a ghost hunt, he felt even more disturbed. There's no time to dwell on the matter, not when the Prime Minister needed to be informed as well. The office of his superior was that only by the setting sun as the home minister entered, casting beams of pinkish lights across the floor and right-hand wall. The home minister gave his now best bow and approach to the desk. Sir, I finally received the reports from my agents. They uh, bring news of a great but deeply troubling development that we cannot have anticipated. Kaya Okinori poured over the documents while his minister could not help but watch the look of concern spread over his face. Finally, the Prime Minister raised his head from the mass of papers, but it suggests that Dai Li's return was little more than a byproduct of the Kempai Tai mismanagement. You cannot mean to tell me that we've been led astray by panic alone. The Home Minister seemed to struggle with bringing forth the necessary words before finally speaking. I, 
I'm afraid so, sir. Our ever investigative path leads us back to either a dead end or back to the initial report. The rumor of Dali infiltrating the army simply falls apart when one examines the situation more closely. This has been a ploy to keep us distracted. It was the Prime Minister's turn to be without capa capabilities to speech. He instead turned towards the window with his mouth covered by a hand, watching as the sun just appeared over the horizon. The room fell into darkness. I need you to find more proof of this disaster. Raid every Kenpai Tai office if you must. This matter needs to die, as he spoke. The Prime Minister did not turn from the window. The whole minister stood up from his seat, bowed, and exited the room. Prime Minister Kaya Okinori could not help but wonder, have we truly been so blind? Now, I did have to use cons commands for this um, to make sure that we can actually get this fired and stuff like that, so this stuff is done for us. Uh, up here, as you can tell, I can reload the game. Uh, we're still trying to pass the bill, but I'm not really con too concerned about it, so it is what it is. Also, I did do some glitchy stuff, not glitchy stuff, but some uh, other stuff here to make sure that hopefully the Cameroonians win, because they're going to win in the end, no matter what happens in this campaign, they're going to win. The Prime Minister's order to raid the Kenpai Tide had been taken to heart by the Home Minister. Not wanting to waste any more time unless the Kenpai Tide discovered that they were compromised, he had been contacted the Navy. Nanjing was a heart of the military police power except for the, around the ports, so they could be found patrolling the streets in equal frequency to the IJA. To crack open their HQ, the Navy would have to provide the manpower. Below decks on, of an IJN warship, a unit of special naval la landing force prepared to storm the streets leading up to Kenpai Tide compound. Surprise was the biggest advantage. As there was no reason to believe the military police had any idea of their presence or impending strike, their orders were simple one open a path to the heart of the compound and seize any documents housed within resistance was to be met with force three boats departed from a warship under the cover of darkness each one filled to capacity of the marines of of the SNLF. Upon entering the Nanjing port, the Marines climbed up onto the decks and headed deeper into the city. The unit then split into two and readied themselves to pinch at the compound. The lone guard at the back gate of the Kenpai Tai HQ was quietly dispatched. A rifle stock which emerged from the shadow connected it with his jaw, knocking him to the ground. Meanwhile, a similar scene took place at the side door where the guard was startled by the Marines before he too was knocked unconscious. With everyone in position, the raid began. Doors at both the back and side of the buildings were kicked open as dozens of SNLF troops swarmed in. Within 30 seconds, most of the ground floor had been taken without as much as a f shot being fired. Only the military police near the army barracks put up much of a fight, although overwhelming gunfire from all sides eventually dislodged them. The building was filled with the sounds of marines rushing towards the upper floors. The race was now on to find the Kenpai Tai's archives before any of them had the bright idea to burn it all to the ground. Not a second can be wasted now, my friends. Absolutely not. These guys better win over here. Somewhere in China, 67. From the open windows of the abandoned farmhouse that Dai Li called a field base came a terrible hacking cough. This was followed by the crashing of glass and the toppling of furniture. To the Jung Tong soldiers who called Dai Li a commander, this was all part of the nightly routine. At the end of the day, he would seclude himself in his farmhouse, drink until he could no longer stand, and then fall into an inebriated stupor. His men cared not, in fact, in fact appreciated the calm after the drunken storm. Silence meant that they could rest and avoid Dai Li's cruel gaze, even so, the coughing was particularly vile that night. One of them suggested that someone could check, should check on him. The idea was immediately shot down, disturbing his sleep was deeply unwise, and usually ended in someone being beaten to the ground. The Jun Dong would simply have to sleep through the torturous noise. The morning usually began with Dai Li viciously waking everyone by whatever means he felt necessary. Yet this morning, Dai Li was nowhere to be found. A decision was made to now finally check on him. Inside the farmhouse, the Jun found the corpse of the commander, the eyes open and mouth, open eyes and mouth, pallid skin and bloody phlegm. Unsure was enough to confirm it then and there. For about a minute, no one dared to even move. Not, not one among them had considered what to do once the dude actually died. Some had even thought he was going to outlive them all. The silence uh, uh, was then broken by suggestion. Everyone found agreeable. We take the body to the woods, bury it, and leave. The body was carried to a clear deep, clearing deep in the woods and buried in an unmarked grave quickly. No one stayed at the spot for long. Once they all returned to the farmhouse, the former Jun Tong exchanged looks and departed. Some wished to return home, most simply wanted a home in return too. Not a word was uttered as these men left their old lives behind. The, the specter of Dai Li haunts no more. And I actually said 67, it's 57. My bad. My bad. I can't read apparently. Even though I'm wearing glasses, I, I apparently can't read. So, Well, I think we have at least one or two more events before that happens, but the truth... Hold your fire. As the haze cleared the entranceway to the Kenpai Tai archives, the bodies of the three military police lay scattered on the ground, where most of them simply lay down their guns or tried to run. It seemed that these men were willing to die for what they were guarding. While well, the commander of the SNLF unit trudged through the blood-strewn and bullet-ridden corridor, he quickly noticed that the door to the archive was firmly locked. Someone get me, go get me a key off of one of the bodies now. A moment later, the key was placed in the commander's hand. He wasted no time in unlocking the door, fearing that he might still have arrived too late. The sight of untouched shelves and cabinets was a relief. Search this place and now get going. As the Marines headed into the archive to begin their search, the commander's attention was quickly drawn to a small unmarked box that had been placed on a desk inside was a single unmarked file. According to every verifiable source at her disposal, it would appear that Dai Li has been dead since the late 50s. The exact cause of his death is not entirely understood, but it can be concluded that alcoholism and general poor health were the contributing factors, despite the descriptions of events given by some of the Dai Li's closest followers. A burial location has not been located either. We're also now aware that Dai Li's followers did not attempt to continue operations following his death. 
We can therefore assume that the Juntong is no longer a threat to the Empire in any capacity. As soon as he was done reading, he turned to his second-in-command who was waiting by the door. Take this dossier to Tokyo. Oh, and I wouldn't dare giving it a look, son. I'm sure everyone will know what's inside soon enough. The deadly myth finally put to rest. And there we have it, my friends. I hate that. Well, it's not quite done yet. We got one more, one more, one more, one more event, I think. So, I hate how, like, it just, it's all glitched still. It's not cool, man. Not cool. The Revelation. Their afternoon was a time when most of Japan found a chance to listen to the radio or watch TV. Therefore, it's a perfect moment to deliver a message to the nation. All of a sudden, one evening, a special broadcast interrupted the scheduled programming on both TV and radio across Japan. For those watching, the Imperial Seal appeared on the screen, which was quickly followed by a blaring rendition of the National Anthem, which also played the, on the radio transmission. After a few moments, both the Seal and Anthem faded away into a recording from the office of the Home Minister. Citizens of the Empire of Japan. A great conspiracy has been uncovered on this day. The Camp I Tai, empowered to enforce peace and stability across the co prosperity sphere, has been uncovered as traitors and turncoats. For several months, they engaged in a scheme to sow chaos and disorder throughout Asia and helped to topple the Emperor's government. Rumors of long dead Chinese rebels and terrorists were spread to deliberately mislead and demoralize the government and armed forces of the Empire. However, due to the swift investigation of those falsehoods, they were dispelled and traced to their source. The Camp I Tai has been pacified, the compounds and offices stormed by the loyal troops of the Empire. Their plot and the very organization is no more. These traitors will be treated as what they are, enemies of state and to Koku Tai. Let the fates await to be a reminder of the strength and security of the Empire. As the Home Minister finished his message, the National Anthem was played again and the Imperial Seal was again displayed. Regular broadcasting resumed just as suddenly as it had been interrupted. We'll do it live. Our insurgencies? Uh, we're not going to click on this stuff anymore. Because... I don't know, we'll see what happens. I'm going to make sure they're going to win. At this point, I'm tired of this stupid war. It's not fair that we cannot send volunteers when... I think... was it? Actually... They're at war now. But the Commonwealth of England actually was able to send volunteers to a nation to a nation down here. So that that's just unfair to us. So I'm not going to tolerate that. So if they can send volunteers, why can't we? Not cool, man. Not cool. But we're still doing our focuses here. But hopefully, this will wrap up the whole uh, thing here too. So there we get it wrapped up. Increase ad admin efficiency. If you're worried about that, please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We live in the managerial age after all. Yep, we're done with it. Great. Plus 50% more political power, better recruitable population factors, supply consumption, stability, ideology drift defense, taxable uh, population factor, social co program cost factor, admin program cost factor, need and consumer goods. Beautiful. 5% growth. 106.5%, which is better. Slightly less deficit. Not bad overall. And now we get 1.69 political power every single day. Very nice. Of course, Cameroon. Armor insurgencies. Oh, I can send some in some equipment. I'm fine with sending some equipment. Other than that, no, I'm done. Sending them stuff, so. Not bad. Slightly getting better over time. With graduation. Oh, the bill passes as well. Look at that. Beautiful. The square drill was lined up with rows of Ogawa's comrades. Some Ogawa knew from his battalion. Others had come from various other training camps near the area. Ogawa knew why they had come. They had come to graduate. Basic training was complete. Atop the four walls that surrounded the drill square stood a collection of generals, training camp officials, as well as the minister for defense himself, Hori Aizo. The man smiled as the company was ordered to march around the square, and smiled even more as it came to a stop, all in perfect order. He stood up to the podium and gave a speech. It is good to see you all. The military was in a sorry state not a few years ago, and for that I give you my apologies. The blame lies on me. I hope you can forgive me, and I understand if you cannot. To see you all standing here, it feels like justice. Hori stopped and sipped at a glass of water. I want you to all know that I have an immense respect for your hard work, for your perseverance and your courage. I want you to all know that you will not be abandoned again. Serve with pride, serve with dignity, serve with passion. He smiled and clapped, thank you for your time. At that, the company was ordered to march from the drill square to the shout of the officers and commanders. The parade awaited, and a thousand hungry eyes would watch on. Officials and notables all across Japan had come to see what the army had become after its reformation. Ogawa Tajiro could do nothing but smile. Let them watch, and we will be glad to show them what the new soldiers of Japan are capable of. March on to a better future, and the fading Boku Minkan. Oh, but after the, the, in the emperor's name. The bitter rivalry that impeded cooperation between the two arms, legs, and eyes of Japan's military, the Army Navy, has finally been put to bed. With a fully functional armed service, the strength of the Japanese nation and its tools is at an all-time high. From the citizens of our prosperity sphere to the Emperor himself, all can rest easy that such a powerful synchronization has occurred. The military shall know no defeats, losses, or disasters. Tendo Haika Banzai. Still looking very good here. Uh, economy, for almost 5% now. Not Oh, 106%. Exactly. Not bad. Less than 12 billion still, not bad. I, I kind of feel like we should just pay off more of the debt if possible, but that wouldn't help us with our growth, which would suck. Do our ships rule the waves? Yes, they will. And we'll see what happens there. Okay, so now we're at 235, which is still not bad. Still good for us. Um, 277 still. 
And this would be, yeah. That's effective. That sucks. Public support is still very high, so I'm not too concerned about that. Just do the technocrats again. 75 political power is fine. 249. Beautiful. Absolutely beautiful, my friends. Nice. Shells. Very good. Good. And good. Because we can. Happy 1969, everybody. Hope you're having a great, great year. But yeah, this has been a very fun campaign, despite the whole great Dia Lee conspiracy thing being just glitched to heck and back. But, you know, other than that, it's pretty good so far. And right now, I'm keeping an eye. Right now, we have a 3, 4, 17 billion in, uh, disparity between the debt and actual uh, like GDP of our nation. So as long as it gets smaller and smaller and smaller, that's all I really care about. Nice. Political favors, as you can tell, as, like I said earlier, just kind of ignoring them, so. There, have some guns. Our ships rule the waves. Oh, yes, they will. More docked up by 50%. Two more naval bases. Increases uh, IJN support. And Yokumo's famous. Oh, he's famous. He becomes famous. He is famous. 14, 7. Iberia forms the Iberian Council. Kono Kayaba stepped out of the yacht and boarded the cruiser Yakumo. Kayaba's regiment, escorted by the cruiser, is to be shipped out to North Borneo, one of the Empire's most important outposts overseeing the Indian Ocean. Yeah, there we go with that. Yet Kayaba was not clearly in the best of moods. Yesterday, he was informed by the supply officer that the meat supply was running low. These idiots from the Guangdong supply station clearly miscalculated the ration for each soldier. And now he's invited by those traitorous Navy guys to go down on the ship. Kayaba thought to himself, Is this some kind of mockery as he set his foot on the desk? Or the deck? He saw that on the meat, or on the mast. And for the first time during Yokomo's service, an army colonel's flag was hoisted. Seeing the flag in surprise and feeling a sense of weird warmness, Kayaba stepped under the bridge and made his way to the officer's dining room. The moment. Kayaba stepped into the room. <clears throat> he was welcomed by a firm handshake by Captain Sakyo, commander of the Yokomo. I'm so glad you came, said Sak Sakyo. Here, try this curry. Our ship just won the fleet curry-making contest. Even Admiral Takagi loved her curry. Overwhelmed by the friendliness of the captain, Kayaba nodded and had a spoonful of Yokomo's pride. Darn it. It was the best curry I ever had, Kayaba thought, but he decided to keep his reserve posture in front of the captain. Those guys are from the rival service, after all. Thank you for this delicacy, Captain Sakyo, Kayaba responded, and what would be the reason that you invited me here today? Uh, Sakyo responded with a smile. Colonel, I've noticed that the protein supply of your men is running low, so I'd like to ask if you'd permit us to share some of, your, of the beef and fish on our ship. I've consulted my officers and my men, and they've all agreed to abstain from meat once in a while if it helps me helping their brothers in arms. Kayaba shook for surprise. What he heard was not what he had expected. Ever since the inter-service cooperation bill got passed, he had heard the tensions were easing up between the army and the navy, yet he clearly did not see himself witnessing this nearly impossible change. He thanked the captain and accepted the offer, consumed his meal silently, and headed to the door as he finished, only before he was stopped by the captain and handed a piece of paper. Colonel, take this curry recipe before you go, and please let me know if your men like it. The fading Boku Minkan, finally. A synthesis of old and new is a rare sight indeed, but Fukuda has seemed to pull it off. With his new breed of bureaucrats, which combines the ambition of the youngsters and the efficacy of the old-timers, our stable, modernizing future has been pulled in place for Japan. From the Imperial Navy to the independence and a portion of the reformists within the Yoko Sankai, these changes have been welcomed with broad approval. And Wallace has won again. And the dam is finished. More political power. Our land influence will decrease, which means nothing. Relations with independence and the reformists also both go up, though. Not by much. Not by much. But they both go up, which is very nice. I want to say we've done very well in this campaign so far. Like, with the economy just collapsing earlier, I was, I was getting worried. I was getting pretty worried. West Siberian Provisional Authority opens a door. At first, a foreign officer merely laughed in the obscure Russian states and an envoy asking to host several diplomats in the capital of Omsk. The diplomat would have been laughed out of Japan entirely for were it not for an opportune meeting he managed to arrange with a prominent businessman. He loudly implied that once Russia is unified, they'd be inclined to offer some extremely lucrative mineral rights deals to the Zaibatsus, in exchange for a few minor diplomatic concessions now. News of this rapidly spread throughout the business world, and soon the diplomatic office was under significant pressure to accept the offer. The conference was of little consequence. The little Russian men had clearly gone to great effort to renovate the city center for our diplomats, but were horrendously embarrassed when a wrong turn on the way when they, from the airport led the mission on a detour through this dirty industrial district of the city. A business expert assigned to the diplomatic team reportedly grew insatiably excited. After spotting the vast reserves of Siberian resources laid out in endless stockpiles, the concessions requested by the West Siberians were mostly minimal, the largest demand being official recognition of them as a legitimate and governed sovereign nation. While we have no guarantee that the West Siberians will actually come out on top of the Russian conflicts, it's a very small request compared to the ten potentially enormous economic gain. A desperate for international st legitimacy. Give it to them. We'll, we'll be repaid if they succeed. Do now the request it looks too far too good to be true. Yeah, there you go. You can have that. I don't care. Give us your mineral wealth. We need it. Uh the man is gonna collapse. Oh, they literally just collapsed. I was gonna say. Okay, look at Angola. I do want to play Angola sometime too. In fighting? Good. They should kill each other. 
Free and Golden Army, huh? Is Omsk open for business? Well, it is for now. 11.38 billion, not bad. Mm, 34 billion. 5% mm -hmm. growth. Republic of Dahomey's gone. Even though we're, we want to support these guys, they're probably still going to back that stab us on what or not, so. Yeah, we'll see what happens. Other than that, we are 5,300. We're just building as many as we possibly can. I could, we could be building more stuff here. Admin offices like in uh, Koko Shantai, but one step to stability. The briefing was short and succinct. At the end of the day, that was all it needed to be, after all. This wasn't supposed to be anything more than a standard, dull, and technical report. One that merely stated that the convoy had left successfully for North Borneo. Good, if all went well, it would be a simple trip. No issues, no drama. Kai hoped so, anyway. He was concerned that there would be some unexpected disaster, intentional or otherwise, that would derail this. However, there had been no indications of it, and so he allowed himself to breathe. Everything would be fine, in the grand scheme of a long and bitter rivalry and competitiveness between the military branches. This was a small, almost minuscule event that was taking place. It was a single step, one on a long, long road to repairing the divisions that had only worsened since the Second World War, but a step nonetheless. With the crease spending across the board and his own efforts to help foster a more cooperative environment, Kai believed that they were already, slowly, starting to bear some fruit. He was under no illusions as to the time and investment that it would take. It would be years, if not decades, that he was aware that it might even persist beyond his own lifetime. However, that did not bother him much. He was secure in his knowledge that his efforts had laid the groundwork for the more stable, secure, and prosperous Japan. And that was more than enough for him to rest easy. Boom and come. Not bad. And we can't do that way. Or the Shepherds of Society as well, but that's okay with us. So after this, settle our differences. Conservative relations increased by 5%. Not bad. Cast aside the corporatists. Oh, we immediately. The age ideals of state paternalism and the self-innovation of the bureaucracy are finally failing our nation. Japan needs to modernize, and these ancient practices will find no place in the vision for our new nation. Absolutely. Because I do want to see what happens if Cameron actually does win, so. Because usually I think they lose in my campaigns. Usually Free France wins, so. Because they have so many allies. And yeah, they have Cameroon starts with more al some allies too, but they're just... They die so fast. They just die so fast. You're fighting too, right? Huh. Yeah, they are. 69, 69. Nice, 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 nice. Good. Well, let's take all this stuff off, too. And go home to... There. Uh, you got not a lot of good forts here. Here. Hiroshima. There you go. Still 249 is pretty awesome. You have some more equipment. We have a lot of political power now. Oh, let me circle that maybe? That'd be pretty good. Defeating Boku Min Khan. Minus 0.13. Obviously, I'd like it to be better than that, but whatever. Is anything else going to get better here? No. Two. No. 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 Huh. And we're still doing that too. So overall, not bad. Oh, it's March. I forgot it was March. Not bad. Hey, even more growth is good. Less than 106% is getting better. Slightly, slowly, slow is it, is it getting better. <sighs> Low hard liner influence. Actually, you should have no influ influence at all. Cult of the Emperor. You know, all this stuff is nice and all, but we can't really use it to any sort of effect. Cast aside the corporatists. And let's end with a set of differences. The two successors vie for support within Kyle's party. With the playground they frolic in must be established. The bureaucracy must never be allowed to dominate Japan unless a conservative faction of the Yokosan Kai and the House of Peers abandon us. If these successors failed to realize this, then some new successors stated must be found in their st stead. Happy April, everybody. Just want to end this episode with them killing off these guys. Can they kill them off in time? God, I hope so. Anything else here? Sure. Actually, that'd be really good to do, probably, too. A little bit of lag. All right. Oh, come on. Keep, eat him up. Eat him up. Come on. Oh, more. Even more production units. What are we supposed to do with all these extra production units, man? Honestly, I'd rather just do this. Go up to 60. It's fine with us. Boom, boom. Because we already maxed out consumer goods spending, so... All right. Expanded task force capabilities... Or we one on the left. Oh, a little bit of lag. Bastion on the sea. Super says of Italy. Um, task forces. I don't like task forces, so I'm actually going to choose one. I prefer carrier organization, battleship organization. That that's the meat and potatoes of what we really need here. So, here have some stuff. How much political power to get? One point seven one is pretty good today, too. Put the fulba. Nice. Yeah, this one lasts a long time. Briefing on the Korean situation. Uh, if we read this again, please go right ahead. I'm pretty sure I've read this before, so. It's fine, whatever. 
Because right now... Oh! There goes Molly? Yeah, we're on civilian oversight, which is nice. Progress is Nanjing. Oh! Defining a legacy. Oh, crap. Monumental decisions were ones which define legacies. Kyle was acutely aware that the next weeks and months would be crucial for cementing his own legacy. <clears throat> we're all driving towards the future of Japan. And all of it was balanced on a knife's edge, as it often was in the cutthroat realm of politics. Fukuda Takeo, the man who would be his successor, was silent as he waited for the Prime Minister to speak. He also knew the consequences if they failed here now. The Highlanders of Kishi and Shina remained a threat to them, and if Kaya was a secure legacy, then they needed to be dealt with. Kaya finally spoke. What is your suggestion? Fukuda took a few moments before he answered uh, the Prime Minister. Uh, if the question was serious, maybe, uh... One might wonder if the question was serious, but Kyle had decided he wanted to be a successor. And because of that, Fukuda knew that whatever he had said would be given serious consideration. Thus, he did not rush to his response. I believe that Kishi and Shina are too entrenched to, uh, to remove directly. Not yet. Doing so, we'll tip our hand to eat early. Their support base should be weakened first, which lies in the Ministry of Commerce. Kyle grunted. He identified that as an option as well. So, if both Kishi and Shina were able to be dealt with this early, it might throw the hardliners into disarray. It was an option on the table, along with another, which was to simply do nothing at all. The latter option was perhaps the most risky, as to rely on the support of the hardliners, who were far from reliable. However, if it was to move against them and fail, rolling the dice on the support would maybe be the safer option. After a few more moments of consideration, Kaya spoke. Kishi's time has come. He and Shida will be dealt with directly. Likely end disaster. You are correct. We will remove their influence in the Ministry of Commerce first. Going after them is too risky. We need to coexist with them for now. Um, Fukuda? Shina has, has his assent. Ooh. I'm not sure which way to go. I wouldn't read that Fukuda has secured his assent, though. The once relatively obscure Takeo Fukuda has enjoyed a meteoric rise in recent times, thanks in large part to the patronage of Kaya, however. It will be wise to exploit his victory to the fullest, to ensure its permanence. All that is needed to secure his continued rise to the highest of powers is to receive assurances of support from Takagi and the independent faction. Ooh, I'm not sure which way we're going to go. I kind of want to do this one. He and Shino will be dealt with directly. Or at the very least, you are correct. I don't think we want to do, do this one, because we're doing really well. I mean, we've got a lot of influence here. They, they generally are okay with us, maybe. House Spirits is okay. we got enough support here anyways. So we'll see what happens. But if you enjoyed the video, leave a like. Subscribe if you're new. Check out my Discord link in the description below. We have 6% real growth, and I'll see you tomorrow. I'll also figure out what's going to happen, and hopefully not have an oil crisis. Thanks for watching. Have a great rest of your day.